magic. It's all around us, but few have the power to control it, to harness it to their will. Hi, I'm Jared Logan. This is the Stream of Blood, where we play tabletop role-playing games. And today we have a special event for you, a special uh, mid-season replacement, uh, a little thing to uh, keep you busy while uh, Vampires of Pittsburgh is on a short break. Uh, today we are bringing you Magi of Pittsburgh. You are going to watch uh, as players create characters for and then play Mage the Ascension. Mage the Ascension, the classic game of modern magic from White Wolf Studios back in the 90s. Um, there is a 20th anniversary edition. <clears throat> oh my God, already my voice is giving out. I'm having a paradox backlash. <clears throat> There is a, uh, a new edition, a 20th anniversary edition that came out several years ago uh, from Onyx Path Publishing. It's a fantastic game uh, that is all about player creativity. Uh, I'm going to get more into the game in a minute. Uh, but before I do, I will just uh, mention the Stream of Blood. Uh, we do like three shows a week on the channel. Uh, we bring you special events like this. Uh, mage game, and uh, we survive right now on Twitch subscriptions. So if you have not already subscribed, please smash, I believe is the term, that subscribe button. If you see uh, someone else in the chat watching uh, these mage shows uh, that you haven't seen before, uh, purchase a subscription for them. We really do appreciate it. The next thing I'll say, because I say it anytime we play, well, almost any game, is that uh, Mage the Ascension is uh, kind of an adult game. Um, it's like pretty much 18 or over, at least the way that I play it. Um, it's less likely to have gore and terror and horror than vampire, but it could have some of those things. It could have violence. It could have mental magics that take over people's minds. Uh, and it could have, you know, uh, adults having adult conversations. So um, if that's the kind of thing that you don't feel like watching, uh, feel free to check out one of our other shows. I will also say that we are always open to hearing your comments, suggestions, concerns, and reactions to our content. And the best place to get in touch with us and tell us uh, your thoughts is on our Discord, the Server of Blood. So get on the Stream of Blood Discord, uh, say hello. Uh, you can tell us what you thought of our content uh, and we do our best to respond and we take it all very seriously. There's also more fun things you can do on our Discord, like discuss role-playing games or discuss music or books that you enjoyed. Uh, what's your last fantasy novel you read? Hop on the Discord. I am ready to have that conversation. Okay, um, I'm really excited to bring in our cast. We are going to do a character creation session today, which we don't always do, but I think Mage is interesting enough in the character creation that it warranted doing. Uh, so I'm going to bring in our players, and we're going to get right into it. This first guy, you've seen her, seen him on our uh, on our shows where we play Blades in the Dark as a member of the Kino Hora. Um, he is also uh, a player on the Better Than Heroes stream, um, which you should definitely check out, where they play Spelljammer, Fifth Edition Spelljammer. That's uh, Outer Space Dungeons and Dragons, um, and he's a comedian. He's a writer, uh, and uh, we're so happy to have him. Please welcome Aaron Urist, everybody. Hello. What's up, buddy? How's it going? I'm good. I'm good. Um, let me ask you. You said you've been watching Peaky Blinders. I have. Just started. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's a, a recommended show to watch if you play Blades in the Dark, which you play that game with us pretty regularly. Oh, uh, are you getting any that. Blades in the Dark inspiration from it? Uh, yeah, a little bit. It's, yeah. it's very good for Blades, absolutely. It's got that sort of occupies that that dirty, dark world of crime yeah. and villainy. And factories. And factories, yes, and absolutely. Smoke, lots of smoke everywhere. That's sort yes. of how you imagine the, the, the world in, uh, in uh, Blades in the Dark. Totally. Uh, but you said before we started that you think Killian Murphy is the most handsome man that's ever lived. Is that what you said? He's extremely handsome. I He looks like he's made out of like porcelain. I, I think, think he has part of it. He looks fragile. He looks I would, I, I would describe him as having a great look. I don't know about the most handsome man in the world. To me, he's a little pasty. Yeah. I don't know if he's the most handsome man. I don't recall saying that, but he's, you said, I, I think you said 
the most handsome man that has ever lived in history. I think that's what you said. He's my husband. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, uh, congrats to your husband, Killian Murphy, uh, a.k.a. the Scarecrow in Batman Begins. <laughs> uh, and let's oh, bring in our right. next player. Uh, she is a uh, an improviser, an actress, uh, and a law student. Um, and uh, a regular uh, player in uh, one of uh, Ross Bryant's uh, home Dungeons and Dragons games, and we we're so happy to have her on the show. Please welcome Sarah Rose Kaplan. Hello, how are you? Hello, really good. How are you? I'm so good. I'm so excited. Any opinions on Killian Murphy? Unattractive. Unattractive. What about we also brought up Benedict Cumberbatch? Thoughts? Also unattractive. Of face, mm -hmm. incredibly attractive of voice when mm. he's not trying to do an American accent. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, I can always notice when a British person is is fumbling their American accent a little bit. I'm always like, yeah, yeah. And then they might be, be, be giving like the most pathos infused performance of all time. Very moving. And I'm still like, no, nope, not a good actor. Um, Occasionally so. you'll hear a really good one and it's super impressive. That is impressive. Oh, um, Sarah Rose, if you have an opinion, and you might not have one, uh, most handsome uh, person that has ever lived. Oh, God. Um, okay. Uh, this is, like, super basic. My mind immediately jumps to Chris Hemsworth as Thor in Ragnarok. Yeah, that's. I think that's a good contender, right? Uh, but I like that you don't just say Chris Hemsworth – as Thor in Ragnarok. So the short hair. The short hair. Yeah. Sense of humor. Like Thor the Dark World. I don't, I'm not into that Thor. Mm -hmm. But, you know, funny Thor. Funny mm -hmm. Thor, I could watch all day. I can get with that. Uh, okay, funny Thor is your husband. Let's bring in our uh, final player. She is a fantastic dungeon master, actress, improviser, uh, who uh, was once on an episode of Um Actually with me. Uh, the hardcore SOBs know about Um Actually because they found it and posted it in our uh, Discord. Um, we're really excited to have her on the stream with us. Uh, please welcome Amy Vorpal, everybody. Hello. Yay. What's Jared, up? you won that Um Actually game. I know well, it's not about I, winning. I always do. Um, <laughs> no. I think uh, I think that that's the most fun game because it's the only game I'm good at. Um, actually, I mean, uh, uh, in terms of competitive games, this is all. You were stellar. Thank you. Yeah, you were stellar as well. Uh, yes. We, uh, yeah, we we brought our deep nerd knowledge, and I'm and I'm also really happy to have a fellow kind of game master playing with me because they always hand you little gifts. Like, you know, game masters when their players are always like, "Don't you mean this is happening?" And I'm like, "Yes, that is what's happening." <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know about magi uh, or magi or what is is it called? Magi. It's is called that, mage, or... but I've called I've called this I know, this little series we're doing magi. Yeah, that's, that's the plural. I guess you could say mages too. But okay. we'll see. I don't know. Yeah. You're like looking. You're like, oh, maybe I'll get some help. But maybe also maybe after having been a dungeon master for so long i'm i've got uh, some pent-up frustration and uh, i'm looking to take it out on someone so <laughs> completely fair and also that's kind of how i when i play i play that way i i always say that i kind of a, am a leroy jenkins and i'm kind of like yes. i'm just gonna i'm just gonna try to push down all the invisible walls here and see how yes. far off the map we can go um, yes, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch look, and Ken Killian Murphy are both hotties with bodies, and uh, I love them both very much. And my brand of man is human-sized hobbit, and uh, I don't, <laughs> I don't know if it, it, put a wig on them and they fit the mold. So, which okay, of them great. is the, which of them is the most attractive man who's ever lived, though? It's Benedict, oh, man. It, Benedict. It's I Benedict, see. Benedict I said this Wentz. earlier. I think he looks vaguely like a greyhound or a vampire. Just yeah, I don't, you're you're just going more into the hot direction, honestly. That's uh, fair. That's fair. <laughs> Guys, greyhounds. Uh, I'm sexy. sorry. Uh, handsomest man that ever lived because I I saw him in in life one time just in my neighborhood walking down the street. 
uh, and I noticed him from like a hundred yards away is Elijah Wood. So I'm with you on the Hobbit thing. What a handsome, handsome man. Oh, uh, I had a, I, I built shrines to I built little as you know a young a young girl probably too old to be doing this but um yeah sixteen years old and I had little I called it they were they were shrines like objectively but in my head they were just collages that existed in my room. <laughs> did you have uh, like candles right. and did you have any Elijah mantras? I I. Uh, you know, it's where, why not air this dirty laundry now? I would, um, <laughs> I would think to myself, I like was into, I, I don't know. I didn't, I wasn't into manifestation or like the secret or the Abraham thing, but this, I was, this is what I was kind of doing in my head. It was just like imagining him at every corner where I would turn around and he would be there. And I would like try to make that happen, even though I obviously had no control over um, his life or his personhood, but yeah, I would just, I would, I would go running and be like, when I turn this corner, Elijah was just going to be, <laughs> uh, well, that's, I mean, what a perfect, uh, segue, uh, because, uh, <laughs> clearly Amy was doing some, uh, Elijah Wood, uh, focused ritual magic, uh, in her, uh, in her teenage years. And, uh, that's absolutely fantastic. And, uh, so that's what we're going to talk about today. So, Mage is a game that a lot of people say is um, their favorite game, but also um, it's kind of a cult classic, I guess, at this point. Some people don't remember it. Everybody remembers people running around and pretending to be vampires, mm -hmm. but they don't remember Mage. That's the one they made after Werewolf, so more people remember Werewolf, and then less people remember Mage. But Mage is maybe my favorite of these things that they made, and, and it's a lot of people's favorite, but also a lot of people say it's impossible to play. Because it is kind of, uh, oh, yes, my wife. Yes, you can bring my coffee right in, darling. Wow. Thank you, sweetheart. Kara Clink, off screen, everybody. Oh. So um, that first sip feeling. <laughs> yeah, why not? So they say it's impossible to play, and I, I highly disagree. I think that, you know, you just have to have a light touch as a GM and listen to your players and kind of let them do the stuff they want to do within reason. So, um, but it has what is called an open uh, form magic system, which means instead of in D and D where you have these spells that do these very specific things and have these specific ranges and durations and, and all those things in mage, you can make up your spells on the fly. You can kind of look at what you have the control control over and you can go, oh, I, I can I can add time to this to make it like a delayed explosion because I have forces. And then I'm going to say a prayer that makes an explosion go off in 20 minutes. Things like that. Um, but it, that takes a lot of thinking on the part of the player uh, and a lot of creativity. And I know that these three players are up for it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And when in doubt, just add, you know. Just ask me, can we do this? This is a, it's, I'm asking for crazy ideas the whole time we play. Oh, cool. So awesome. let's, it's going to be really cool. Um, so let's look at the character sheet, if you don't mind, Secret Storyteller Clinton Trucks, and we'll just see how super complicated it is. Um, it looks a little bit like a vampire sheet from today. Oh, and by the way, I went ahead and I updated the old character sheet to kind of fit um, the new rules. Vampire came out with a new edition. And I have updated this to be a little bit more like Vampire 5th Edition because I've updated the magic rules to be a little bit more like Vampire 5th Edition, which has a lot of updated rules. We don't have to go into all of that right now. When we start doing magic, we can talk about that stuff right now. Uh, I'm just going to... We, we talked a little bit about your characters beforehand in an email thread. Right now, I'm just going to ask uh, each of you... Um, how you see this person that you're about to create. And I don't even mean their magic yet, but like what kind of personality do you think you'd like to give them or, or what, what is their occupation when they're not a sorcerer or, um, and the only thing you need to know is that they all are currently in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Maybe they've lived there their whole lives. Maybe they've come there recently and they will be members of a cabal together. So they are friends they are uh, fellow practitioners and colleagues in the world of magic. So those are the things that you need to know about them. And so um, I'll start with you, Aaron. Uh, how do you see your character? Who is he or her or, or um, they? My character um, is a he. He um, 
is a student, uh, like a grad student and researcher, um, maybe an ex-grad student and researcher. He has struggled uh, throughout his life with uh, various mental illnesses and uh, sometimes hallucinations that some may or may not have to do with him being a secret wizard. Um, and he has uh, sort of a brilliant but troubled mind um, for uh, math and words. Uh, he also comes from a um, partially from a strict Jewish uh, background that he was eventually taken out of as a young person and drifted in and out of, and that uh, has influenced his uh, sort of both his uh, like mathematical uh, hypotheses and his mental illness and his magic. Um, I love it. And, um, you know, there's so many kind of influence your, influences you're drawing from, like a beautiful mind and stuff like that, totally. which I think is like very interesting. And and it says in the book, see, you just ask the players what they want and you realize that they go ahead and think of stuff that's already in the book that like mages in this world, like sometimes they're like normal people living their normal lives, but they everybody thinks they're crazy or or they're very troubled, like uh, uh, weird things happen around them and no one can explain it, but then people ostracize them for it. And so they have tough lives and then one day they awaken. They uh, they call it the awakening, uh, not like Kate Chopin's The Awakening, but just like the, ma the magical awakening where they suddenly realize that they can do magic. Um, so if we can look at the character sheet one more time and I'm just gonna show our viewers how we fill it in. So for example, we're going to start with your attributes, and I think we have a clear idea of your character from what you described right here. So um, you're going to uh, prioritize the three things up top. You see under attributes physical, social, and mental. You're going to tell me which one's the most important, which one's second, and which one's the least important. Um, and I'd say mental is probably his most important, right? Definitely. Yeah. Right. And then do you think physical or social is second? Um, probably social. Great. Uh, then that would leave uh, physical as our tertiary. So you're going to um, place, uh, and we'll just go ahead and place them right now if you don't mind, Clinton Trucks, like on this sheet, and then we'll erase for our for our fellow players. Make sure you're putting it on your sheet at home, Aaron, so you have like a, a permanent copy here. Sure. Um, Actually, but, um, I, I sort of want to switch that up. I think physical might be second and social might be third because I don't know how great he is with yeah. people. Yeah. No, that makes sense. And, you know, he might have some composure. Um, I should explain what some of these things mean. Composure is your ability to stay calm, to stay centered, to focus, right? Mm. Uh, and under mental resolve is kind of like your, like, willpower, stick to uh, belief in yourself, stuff like that. Oh, I don't so, even have that on my sheet. I think I have the wrong character. Uh, we, sent a, we sent a Nia shit. A new sheet that has been updated uh, that looks like this one uh, with the uh, with the stream link. So um, go ahead and throw that up. I'll and, make uh, let, sure to get that up. Yeah, and then uh, let me know. Like uh, you're gonna put dots on into these things based on what was the most important to you. For example, here under mental, you're gonna put seven more dots into mental. So if someone has zero dots, that means they don't like they would have zero intelligence, which means they wouldn't be able to be a playable character. So you start with one in everything. <laughs> No, it's true. Uh, if you had like zero zero dexterity, you wouldn't be able to like walk. Um, right. So uh, so uh, let's let's let me ask you seven dots in mental, Aaron. Where do you think they go? I think. Um, hmm. Can I share a dot story real quick? This is yes, going to be please. very fast. But in Australia, the way that they, the slogan for Domino's Pizza, because Domino's have the dots on them or the pips or whatever you want to call them. But yeah. their slogan is, who's got the hots for what's in the box with the dots? No. <laughs> and it's, but in an Australian accent. 
who's got the hots for what's in the yeah. box with the dogs? Hey, hey, he's got the hots for what's in the <laughs> yeah, you already so it's like they they just are playing on that <laughs> aw sound over and over and over. What about well, who's got the hots for the dots? Why not just go to that? Who's got the hots, hots for what's in the box? Because then they'll forget that it's in a box, Jared. Right. Yeah, oh, you. Okay. I mean, Domino's isn't actually. That's a good point. But it, the thing is, it's Domino's, so it's branding. They're not advertising the dots on their box. They're advertising what's in the box with the dots. So, um, remember that seven tie-in for Domino's like uh, many years ago, where it was just like, "What's in the box?" <laughs> pizza. <laughs> It's just pizza. It's just pizza, Brad Pitt. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I thought it was weird that they tied in with the movie Seven, but you know, they, <laughs> and then they they eat Domino's pizza like five times in that movie. Um, okay, they have, a, they have a pizza named Gwyneth Paltrow. So yes, the Gwyneth Paltrow <laughs> special. It's got a lot of head cheese. Um, <laughs> Man, I was uh, all right. Think, I, was, I was gonna think about my dots while we talked about this, and then I didn't. Oh, well, yeah. that's okay. Instead, I, I laughed and had fun. No, <laughs> it's okay. Why don't I? Why don't we talk to one of our other uh, players about their character, and and you can just like we can come back to you. So spend seven on your most important one, five on your second one, and three on your least important one. And a, a rating of two means average. If you have two dots, that's an average Joe. Uh, and then in everything above that means you're kind of better at it. You're above average and then you're kind of gifted and then you're amazing. You're like, by the time you get to like five dexterity, you're like an Olympic level athlete. Okay. Um, so that's just an idea of how that will work. Oh, and, and we have Clinton Trucks, our secret storyteller in the, uh, in the, in the room. What's up, Clint? Uh, I just wanted to uh, add something to the game real quick. <laughs> Yeah, this is good. This is good. <laughs> oh, I didn't know it was a song. I, I Amy, also didn't, you didn't know that. It was a song. I didn't know. I didn't know because I stopped when I learned that because I was like, that's good. And that's good enough. I never went further than just knowing that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think that you made the right choice. And now we all have to live with the song. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Clinton Trucks. Um, <laughs> let's let's Amy, since uh, since we're uh, since you uh, you brought the, this song into our lives, it's now your turn. <laughs> okay, um, that's well, how do you see uh, your character as a person? What do you who who do you think that they are? Before we get into all their magic and stuff. Yeah. Well, they? I think she's had a bit of a rough life. She's got a very dysfunctional family. Um, uh, she's she her uh, and her name's Charlotte. People call her Charlie. She's she's a bartender um just and and just has been she kind of worked her way up from bus girl to server hostess to bartender um at just a, a local dive uh marty's and they 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 service the blue collar crowd so just like two dollar one dollar beers that kind of thing beautiful um i actually really love that um marty's i'm just writing it down because it's important uh, well, I should and... write it down too because I just came up with it. <laughs> well, no, that's good, and it does sound like a Pittsburgh dive bar. Um, uh, and uh, so, uh, with that, with that kind of sketch in mind, which is perfect, um, what do you think is her most important, physical, social, or mental? Social would be most important. Great, and so um, charisma, I think, speaks for itself. It's her kind of magnetism. Manipulation is uh, I, you. You understand that it's deceiving or or getting people to do what you want, uh, maybe against their will. And compose just what I explained earlier. It's kind of your your cool, your calm, collectedness. So um, you have seven dots to spend here. Where do you think you'll put them? So with seven, I think I'm going to do charisma for three, for sure. Um, composure for two. Um, and then manipulation for two. Great. So she's a social she, she's a social powerhouse and, and she's she, and she's good at like all all uh, all three of the social things. Um, Clinton Trucks is filling that in. It looks like he's having trouble, but we're gonna go ahead and uh, trust that he can get it. Uh, and then uh, it what won't do you click think for mental? me, Jared? It won't click. I'm trying to well, click and it won't uh, click. I, I got it about the dots. So uh, when I bring up this character sheet, it starts with one dot in every 
ability. Yes, yeah, so that, that is that that's is the way it's supposed to be. That is the you way it is supposed one. to be. Yeah, because yeah, if you had zero wits, you would just be a hapless fool. You wouldn't be able to even be playable as a player character. So everything starts at one. Clinton Trucks, uh, thank you for trying. We 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 get it. Amy's got her sheet taken care of. Um, what's next, Amy? Do you think physical or mental for Charlotte? Um, I think as a bartender, I mean, she she probably has a bit of bouncer in her, so I'm gonna say physical. Great. And um, strength, dexterity, stamina as a dungeon master, you know what stamina is constitution, basically. Okay. Um, what do you think? Uh, where do you think you're putting the dots for those? Uh, do I have seven or how many do I have for this? Oh, thank you. Yeah. No, um, uh, five for your second most important thing. Okay. Then I'm going to give her three again for strength, one for dex, one for stamina. Great. Um, she's a she's a bit of a bruiser. She is. She. I I really think that in you know if there's a bunch of uh, blue collar construction slash steel mill workers, she's got to be able to hold her own. Um, if she's got to get some drunk assholes out of her out of her bar, which I, I think she's takes taken some ownership of now that she's been there for ten plus years. That makes total sense. Um, so her uh, her her tertiary category of attributes is her mental. Uh, she only gets three here. Uh, okay. A rating of two is average. Usually people just go one of each and then I'm average in those things. But uh, maybe you have a different idea. Um, and ask me questions. Wits is sort of how quick thinking you are. It has to deal with noticing things a lot of the time. Um, and it's sort of instinct okay. as opposed to intelligence. Well, I'm going to go ahead and just give her two for resolve and one for wits and just leave intelligence as is. I think I think this is also going to be a good foil to our other character um, that we already have built as well. Yes, and, that's a good idea. Smart. Yeah. I like so that. She, he's, she, he's she a big won't brain. Think too, yeah, he's a big brain and she'll just do what he says. And if she doesn't notice things, you know, she can she can just uh, punch punch out anything that's coming at her. Great, and um, uh, that's perfect. And speaking of our, our other character, does he have a name yet, uh, Aaron? We have Charlotte. Do we know what uh, what our grad student's name is? His name is Avner. You can call Avner. him Avner. I love it. You can call him Avi. Avi. Avi okay. And Avi's a big brain. Um, just uh, did you did you drop any dots in his uh, in his categories yet that you could tell yes. us about? I, I've put four into intelligence. Mm hmm. And I have put two into wits and one into resolve. Oh, great. Okay, so um, you can go ahead and do, as I said, uh, you know, as we went through with Amy for his, uh, his uh, I think you said his physical is next and then his social. So five for his physical and three for his social. And I'll just bring this up now because we have four in intelligence for Avi. You can put a specialty beside anything you have four or more dots in. And it means that you get like, I, I believe, an extra die when you roll it. Um, so, um, uh, that means you, you'd, uh, pick a quality to his like intelligence and when that applies to the action he's doing, uh, for example, logical, when he is using logic in an intelligence based role, then he will get like an extra die or you could put, I mean, a different one might be, um, Oh, uh, memory. So if he's trying to remember something and he rolls, then, you know, he'll get an extra die. Things like that. You would just pick okay. some kind of quality to his intelligence. Uh, and the same goes for other players. If they have four in anything, and that goes for this, when we get down to the abilities later, um, you can add a little, a little uh, word or name or, or spe specificity to it that gives you a little bonus. Um, Sarah... Let's talk about your character. Who do you see this person as? What, who, what are they like? Yeah. Um, I've been on a journey with this character. Uh, <gasps> she's changed many times. But her final form, Maria Stone, okay. is a bash the fash queer street medic. Uh, awesome. part, she's part of the Queer Liberation Front. They're a group of street medics active in the Pittsburgh anti-fascist scene. And okay. I oh imagine her, she's, um, I have a whole backstory here, but I won't. Well, get please. Into it. No, no, no. Yeah, okay. I mean, look, give as much as you want and, and don't worry. Like if, if I, I'm like, okay, we have to move on. I'll just, uh, I'll just tell you and you, you know, okay. that's fine. Yeah. Wait. I'm thinking, um, the queer liberation front that she's a part of is, an offshoot of a much more pacifist 
queer magical coven that would have descended from the Institute for Sexual Wissenschaft, uh, Magnus Hirschfeld's. Um, and after the Institute for Sexual Wissenschaft was kind of uh, destroyed by the Nazis during World War II and the survivors made their way to the United States, they started living in secret and practicing all sorts of body modification magic. It was a trans magical community, um, but they didn't want to be found out. But the Queer Liberation Front is the modern iteration of it. They can't live in the shadows anymore. And they, um, they work as street medics because they have so much experience in, in sort of medical magic. Um, I absolutely love it. I think it's a really, really kind of compelling kind of um, role, you know. Um, uh, so uh, tell me about Maria. Um, and what do you think uh, her her primary is? Is it social, mental, physical? It's social, for mm -hmm. sure. Specifically, composure. I think the four points go four points for composure. Uh, so you're gonna bring it all the way up to five? Yeah. Great, I'll allow it. Um, and then that leaves you with uh, three more points. Um, where are you gonna drop those? Uh, two in charisma and one in manipulation. Great. Um, and then do you think uh, mental or physical is her next uh, spot that she goes? Well, I'm thinking about that. Um, to get, not not to preview the magic a little bit, I've, I've been reading my Mage the Ascension guidebook. Mm -hmm. Uh, even though she is sort of a bruiser in in the context of a street brawl, uh, I think she gets that more from her life magic that she uses to strengthen mm -hmm. herself up. I think her natural points probably come are in mental and then physical. Great. And when we get down to the abilities, you know, you could just put a lot of dots in your brawl or like those uh, those abilities that will help you be more of a combatant. If that's what is that if that's how you see her um, and, and you can go, you know, kind of less dots in physical right now. And that's fine. And like you said, life magics will help as well. So um, so great. So um, I'll, I'll go ahead and just let you place dots. We don't have to go, you know, I don't have to hear like where every single one goes. Uh, if there's something you want to mention or ask about, please do right now. Uh, but, you know, fill in five dots for her mental uh, and uh, three dots uh, for her physical. Um, and uh, I, I'm already kind of getting excited because I can see like, uh, like a character like that, um, maybe so, some of the traditions that she might belong to. Um, and uh, I've talked about that a little bit with Aaron, uh, his character, like maybe what kind of groups have been trying to recruit him because there are all these magical secret societies in this game and they're very fun to kind of mess around with. And uh, I've determined that they do give like a, a little bonus in terms of XP when you learn new magic or um, when you are actually practicing magic with certain spheres. Um, but we'll get into that in a minute. I don't want to quite get into the, the the magical side of their lives quite yet. Let's now talk about abilities. You'll see uh, that there are now three columns of abilities beneath your attributes. And those are uh, things that might be called skills in other games. But uh, skills is just the middle category, which is like very practical, kind of hands-on stuff. Talents are sort of more uh, intuitive things that people are born with or have a knack for. And knowledges are things that people know. Um, and so you will now uh, prioritize these things uh, by uh, choosing the most important one, which will get 13 dots. The second one, which will get uh, nine dots. And the least important one, which will get five dots. Um, Rather than going into every single dot for everybody, uh, which would become incredibly tedious uh, and uh, kill the magic, uh, I'm just going to ask you a little bit about you know where you're throwing some of your dots and what you think your most important thing is. So let's go in reverse order now. Sarah, where do you think uh, Maria is putting a lot of her um, her dots? Where's her like 13 area? I think her 13 area. Um, is probably in talents. Talents, right? Um, and where are you? Where? Where? What? What kind of um talents are you looking at that you kind of want a, a couple dots in? I'm thinking specifically brawl, streetwise, and awareness are probably her three main 
in her three main talents. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, so go ahead and put 13 in there. Uh, and then what do you think her second category is? What's, what's, no. Where is she going to get nine dots? Knowledge, knowledges. So now that we're over on knowledges, there's a couple things that, you know, I mean, obviously people might be like, what, what is? What is that? Um, uh, enigmas is sort of like solving m m not mysteries in the terms of like, wait, there's a footprint here. Who murdered this man? But like sort of like the big kind of uh, magical mysteries and, and problems and uh, and strange entities like what what does it want? You know, things like that. Cosmology has to do with the, um, you know, in this game, you can kind of travel throughout the multiverse. You can go to these other worlds that are beyond the veil of reality to like you know, strange, deep, umbral worlds that exist in people's minds and stuff, and cosmology would help you with that. Esoterica is exactly what esoterica is in real life. It's kind of like um, fringe beliefs, um, uh, you know, uh, rituals, uh, strange, or not strange, I don't want to say strange, but sort of maybe obscure religions, and it would help you identify perhaps someone else's magic or um, apply rituals to your own magic to get little bonuses and things like that. And, and occult is knowing just about like uh, other mages, but also like werewolves or vampires or ghosts and how to deal with those things. That's what occult is, as well as, you know, um, UFOs and uh, conspiracy theories and all the things that would fall into the occult section of the bookstore. So that's my <sighs> long-winded explanation of all of that. And uh, I will go ahead and let uh, Sarah uh, fill in 1395 for Maria. And then I will ask Amy, uh, where, where, do you think, uh, where do you think Charlotte's, uh, her main uh, column is here? Talents, skills, or knowledges? I think we go 13 for skills, 9 for talents, and 5 for knowledges. And Perfect. I really want, I like the idea of this bonus situation. So I'm gonna put four for sure in etiquette because I'm also getting a vibe that um, as far as, even though she she and, um, uh, sorry, what uh, Sarah, what was your character's name? Maria. I, Maria. So she and Maria are gonna be like fighty, fighty babies. Um, I also like the idea that her bartender slash bouncer could also talk things down. So I'm going to put, I'm going to put down um, etiquette for four and try to get a bonus up in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. De-escalation or um, de-escalation. No. Well, yeah. I, I put a, I put in, well, maybe, maybe that's a better. What did I'm you gonna, put in? Okay. So, <laughs> so I have four in strength and charisma as far as attributes. So my strength, I said security, uh, which sounds vague enough that maybe you'd let me use it in, <laughs> in, in whatever situation I want to, um, as long as I'm securing the situation. Uh, and then I mean, maybe, yeah, maybe. And then charisma, I wrote, I wrote simmer down, but maybe etiquette is is simmer down. I love simmer down. It sounds like something a Pittsburgh native would say. Yeah, I think I think uh, simmer down is great for etiquette. Um, okay. I think security security is fine for um, security is fine. I, I mean, because to me that means you're not trying to hurt somebody. You're trying to get like, them to subdue, safety. Get yeah, them, yeah, subdue. So that is specific. I think that's okay, completely cool. specific. And then um, th that would leave a bonus a bonus deal for charisma, which I'm. Uh, I guess, I guess in those situations, it's more, it's like, it, would that be like fitting in? Like, is that something? I love that. Yeah. It, it, why is she likable? She fits in, she fits yeah. into any group. Like that's, that's great. Okay. Um, and, and so, uh, so we're going 13 skills and then you're going, uh, you said Nine. talents and then knowledges. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think she's got some, yeah, I think she's got, I, I did in it skills. I'm going to go more etiquette and melee. Um, which oh, seem to counteract each other, but but I think that's good. I was thinking about martial arts, but I don't think she's trained literally at all. Like she's got no formal training uh, for any of this stuff. It's just her trainings on um, on people. So just interactions and experience. Perfect. Uh, that all makes sense. And uh, I'll go ahead and let you fill in all of those dots. Uh, anybody okay. interrupt me at any time if you're like, wait, how many again for this? And I will help you. Um, finally, let's talk about Avi. 
Uh, Avi, what do you think his, is he going talent, skills, or knowledge is for his most important? I think for the 13, Avi is going to go with knowledges. Mm -hmm. And the secondary will probably be skills. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And then talents. And then talents. Okay. Uh, and um, where is he getting a lot of dots in his knowledges? That's what I'm curious about. I'm curious about that too. Uh, I think academics and science are sort of no brainers mm -hmm. just given his background, but I'm trying to figure out what he would be good at. I think he would take to computers pretty well given I, um, that sort of brings me to the, for the extra, what's it called when you have uh, four dots or more? A specialty. A specialty I put cryptography. Mm, I love it. Um, I will say, you know, um, since you have 13 dots to spend here, and, and now we are finally getting a little bit into the magical side of our characters, and it's it's happening happening naturally, which I love. You kind of, when we talked to, uh, off, off uh, kind of said maybe Kabbalah plus mathematics is right. kind of part of his... Um, That's where I'm getting the cryptography, is that I think he applies the rules of gematria, which is uh, sort of Jewish slash Hebrew numerology, he applies that to like big mathematical ideas in ways that sprawl out and get fucking crazy. Uh, I love it. Um, uh, I think uh, enigmas, esoterica, and even cosmology. Because I know, I mean, yeah. if he branch, if he branches a little bit out of gematria into Kabbalah, a little bit, that is definitely about like the construction of the universe, right? right. So, well, um, gematria is part of Kabbalah. Yes, okay. It's like the, that numerology has to do with the sort of Kabbalist readings into the traditionally gematria specifically. Um, it's like analyzing the numerological values of biblical text and how that applies to Kabbalah. It gets pretty fucking weird. It's super interesting. Well, here's why people say Mage is a hard game to play, because not everybody can bring Aaron Urist's Gematria uh, to the table. Sure. Uh, but, but we all have our own little weird uh, obsessions or, or Wikipedia rabbit holes we have gone down, and that's why I love this game, because that's what you make a character based on your favorite Wikipedia rabbit hole. Exactly. And it doesn't that's have to be Gematria. It could be serial killers or rabbits or i don't know whatever the thing is the weird thing is astrology whatever the weird thing is that you're interested in you can turn it into kind of your character's magic so i'll leave you to do your 1395 for your abilities um uh, sarah and amy have you kind of finished those up or you feel like you're getting to a stopping point with those great so now we can talk um uh, magic and uh since i started with uh aaron then i started with sarah this time i'm going to start with amy um, we need to kind of talk about uh, how did Charlotte awaken? And like, um, we, we kind of see that um, Avi had like kind of rough life where people thought he was ill before he awakened to magic. Like, did Charlotte have any kind of idea that she was a mage? And what were the hints if there were any? And then how did she suddenly realize she could do magic one day? Oh, you know, can I, can I talk about what I think my magic comes from then? Yes, so absolutely. I want to I want to just go full on um into holidays holidays uh as are celebrated now and and including the way they're celebrated but not also just missing the uh like the link you sent me the pagan beginnings of these holidays and where they right. came from um but really honing in on consumerism and that kind of thing and having a bar and managing the money but also you know, planning events for the bar would be, oh, it's St. Patrick's Day, which is probably the biggest day in the for for the bar for Marty's. Um, so so I think I think I think Marty's the bar was always a home, more of a home for her than than her actual home where it was just super dysfunctional and I'll decide specifics on that later. But you know, a lot of a lot of uh a lot of mental abuse for sure and maybe some even physical abuse and then marty's was just she she had power there so she loved it there and when and her responsibilities started growing and growing and soon she became 
she just loved the the holiday spirit of every single holiday. She got to decorate, she got a budget. Um, and then there was a whole sense of community around that time. So I think she probably awakened on a real, a real stupid day, um, like Valentine's Day or something. Oh, where... wow. Interesting. Okay. Um, <laughs> I love it. I mean, I imagine like, you you know, it seems like she's been in that bar so long. Like maybe she was there as like a little girl with her dad on the stool beside her, you know? Um, oh, it wouldn't be her dad. It would be someone outside of her family, I think, because I think her family is, is real problematic. Um, Ooh, but, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like a, a, a local, a local, I like, a, I like the idea of a fa father figure, a local man who maybe took her under his wing um maybe marty himself screw it i think marty himself. yeah it's marty why not it's marty um, and um and just that the idea of like the days and the calendar um that definitely like goes toward um <coughs> witchcraft in interesting ways uh and uh when we are talking about secret societies and like the types of mages uh, that exists out there, you can be an orphan mage, which means you're completely uninitiated. You haven't joined any of the secret societies yet. Okay. You're kind of making it up as you go along. Or I think for you, um, you might be a part of an organization, uh, only if she would be interested in joining them, uh, who are called the Verbene. And the Verbene are like witches. And they basically would, they would do kind of the, the wheel of seasons magic and be teaching her a little bit about uh, you know, Wiccan practices and earth power and things like that. Um, and, and basically how uh, the seasons, the changing of the seasons can be worked into your magic and things like that. But I'm fine either way. Like maybe, maybe they tried to recruit you and you said, no, maybe no one has found you here in this bar. Like uh, you're like this sort of raw talent. I mean, it's really up to you. It's what you feel would be most exciting to play as a character. Okay, cool. Um, I mean, I like the idea that she's in the middle of getting getting um, familiarized with how the magic works, and she gets it wrong, um, maybe. But but I mean, she still can do it. But I mean, even you say verbene, and I'm like, is that verbena? Um, which is just, I think, a moisturizing agent. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it is. It so. is. It is. A, maybe I'm just pronouncing it differently. I think that you are you're right it is it, it's like an herb yeah uh, an so herb they yeah. themselves off of, off of this herb that so the verbena oh. they do life magic is their primary thing um, oh i see yeah as their okay. as their like main specialty and if you if you joined them or if you were initiated of them you would get a little bit easier uh time when you do life magics but you certainly don't have to and i can also if you're like uh, tell me what are the other groups i can talk to you about those or you can just go, I'm on my own. No one's discovered me yet. I'm like a complete raw talent. I'm in what? danger, basically. Oh, I'm <clears> in danger. <throat> okay, so so I guess joining a magical, uh, something with a magical title that, that provides protection is what you're saying? It can. It certainly can. Uh, it's called, a, they call them the nine magical traditions. Okay. Um, and they, they're all, these traditions are secret societies. And uh, that would mean you maybe have a mentor teacher who's kind of teaching you. We could put give you dots for that. It might mean that you've gotten like some kind of magical treasure or like item that you can use. Um, you would have access to resources and yes, people to protect you, keep an eye on you. Uh, but sometimes people just, they're interested in that, that story of like Neo waking up one day and having the agents come after him. So um, it's, it's totally, it's totally your call. I think I think I like I, I think her I think her past is is um just dark enough that maybe maybe she does maybe maybe let's put her in a thing. Let's give her a group. I like okay. I like the idea of the wheel what'd you call it? The wheel of the year. Life the wheel magic. of the year, yeah. Yeah, let's um, do it. Great. Okay, so um let's uh just bring up the sheet so I can show you uh the spheres of magic. So okay. the spheres are down there underneath what you filled in for your abilities. And um these are the things that your character can control uh magically. And you get six dots, uh, but one will automatically go into life if you have joined the verbine. Um and so uh okay. um 
the more dots you have in something, the more control you have over it. Um, so I have five left to spend or do I have a six? You have five left to spend. I yeah, one must spend. go into life if you're going to be a member of the Verbine. Um, uh, actually, sometimes it gives like alternate choices, but I think in my in my chronicle, in, the, in this particular group of Verbine that you might be joining, they, they do specialize in life. Okay. So um, let me tell you what some of these things mean because they're a little... They can be a little confusing. Correspondence is like um, space and the relationships between things. It's without correspondence, you can't act at a distance. You know, uh, you can't uh, uh, put a pin in the voodoo doll and have somebody ten miles away go Ugh! unless you have correspondence and you have a lock of their hair and you're able to work at a distance using correspondence. You can see things at a distance. You can pull things from your home 50 miles away and at higher levels you can start to teleport or even make like, you know, change the direction of a street because you can manipulate space. Uh, entropy is, you know, the center cannot hold, chaos theory, uh, chance, uh, you know, all of those things that kind of go into probability. Uh, and at early levels, you can kind of like see weaknesses in things. Mm. Um, uh, but as you get higher, you can kind of make uh, coincidences occur. Uh, and then as you get much higher, because it is about how things kind of fall apart, you can start to age things like instantly or or, or, or do the reverse, like make them more youthful and perfect and work with more efficiency because you remove the entropy from them. Um, forces is like lightning, fire, gravity, uh, wind, everything that is a force, a physical force. Life is, uh, I think, pretty self-explanatory. Um, at early levels, you um, can, at like level one, you can see life, like you could have like a life sense, you know, uh, to where you can see life forms even if you're in pitch blackness. But as you get more levels, you can affect more complex life and uh, transform it. I think by the time you get to level three, you can start like growing claws or uh, touching a, a, an apple and turning it into a poison apple, things like mm -hmm. that. Uh, matter is uh, non-organic uh, material, so uh, stone, metal, uh, anything like that, and you can again, you can uh, you can start to manipulate it, reshape it. At uh, higher levels, you can transmute it, things like that. Um, mind, you get you get what that is. Early levels, you're just messing with emotions or or hearing thoughts. Higher levels, you are creating entire swaths of memory for people. Um, okay, this one requires a lot. Of, well, maybe not that much explanation. Prime. Everybody's like, what is prime? Prime is magic itself. So this is how you do counter spelling. Someone shoots a spell at you and you go, no, I take it apart with Prime. <laughs> you know, um, uh, uh, and there's uh, a mechanic in the game where if you um, keep doing magic and it keeps going wrong, you earn these points called paradox. Can we kind of shift down uh, Clinton Trucks and we'll show them the little paradox wheel. And paradox is really bad because if you get a lot of paradox – your magic goes completely haywire and horrible spirits come to eat you alive or um, you you meant to like just set one guy's pants on fire and instead you created a towering inferno and prime will let you kind of mess with uh, you'll me mess with the paradox a little bit uh, and 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 sense magic and things like that and then finally who boy there's spirit and time uh, there's the paradox wheel Clinton trucks is showing it to you so then there's spirit and time and spirit deals with, um, uh, you know, ephemeral entities like ghosts. And, and, and in this world, every, according to some belief systems, everything has a spirit. So not only does that tree have a spirit, but also that computer or that iPad. And, um, you can also, so at early levels, you can kind of see these things and talk to these things. And then at higher dots, you can actually enter the spirit world and that cosmology stuff I spoke of earlier, you can go into other worlds uh, or you can travel into someone's nightmares or something like that. And then finally time at early levels, you have like perfect timing with things or you can see a little bit into the future or the past. And then at higher levels, you can slow people down or make yourself faster uh, and even time travel uh, at very high levels. Okay. <sighs> <sighs> All of that. To, now that we've gotten our explanation out of the way, uh, Amy, where do you think uh, Charlie is going to put her dots? Okay. I, I'm trying to just think of how I'm going to use 
use these holidays. And the main, I think it's spirit because I, you know, there's going to be, I guess, I guess if I, you know, call upon the Easter bunny, which is what I would do, it, it would be like, okay, um, I, I would want to scatter, like if we had a MacGuffin or something, I would want to scatter it, maybe create, maybe this isn't spirit, but like create a bunch of, of crazy knockoffs and scatter them throughout wherever we are, the store or the study or the living room. And then then they would have to, like the people ideally would have to go one by one and see which one's real. Um, but the, I mean, I'm, I know I'm coming up with hypotheticals, but like the Christmas no, I spirit, like I, like I wanna channel Santa Claus and then make everyone just joyful and happy and greeting each other, which kind of goes into my etiquette of simmering down, but um but well, these are these are great because what you're already doing is, you know, when you do your magic, you have to come up with like plans like this. And the more elaborate it is uh, and appropriate to what you're trying to do, the more bonuses you'll get and it'll become a little easier. Right. Yeah. So um, so you're already doing that. Um, it sounds from what you've told me just now, spirit is really I love the idea of bringing in these like spirits of the holidays or spirits of the the, the, the time or the season, like to kind of do your bidding. That's awesome. Um, we know you have uh, at least one dot of life. You're going to take some dots of spirit. Uh, and then, you know, when you're talking to me about like kind of making people calm and stuff, that sounds like a little bit of mind magic. Is that something you're interested in as well? I think it's more, um, I mean, I think because of the consumer, the, I want to lean into the consumer's nature of the stuff I'm doing. So maybe it's mine, but maybe it's matter. So it's like toys and trinkets and candy uh, and stuff you can actually touch um, that I can, I can mess with, uh, like the beer, you know, like if, if I'm able to make people like channel St. Patty's or something and, and then make everyone, well, maybe that's mine, like make them a little bit buzzed. Um, yeah, so matter would allow you to to alter matter and do things with matter, which I think is super cool, and I love the idea of like being the perfect beer, uh, you know, uh, creating the perfect beer for somebody. And you could with matter. See, so there's multiple ways to do the same thing. You could okay. with matter if you had like a little bit of chemical knowledge, like just like spike the beers with something that calms people down using matter magic, or kind of like use a combination of mind and matter or just use mind, right? Like that your ritual is like giving somebody a perfect top on their beer. That's your ritual. And then you're using like mind <laughs> too to soothe their emotions, right? So I like, like mind, I like mind because I, because yeah, there's, you know, there's a ho holidays of um, Labor Day. I could make them more relaxed or actually work harder. Or I could also uh, do St. Valentine's Day and make them, you know, kind of, make them be in love. Uh, yeah, that makes like a lot mine. of sense. That makes a ton of sense. Um, so uh, six dots all together. One has to go in life. Let me know. Uh, you can tell us in a minute. You can go yeah, ahead and fill those decide. in. Okay. Uh, but it sounds like mind, spirit. Those are great things. And if you have a question, just let me know. Um, one me one question. Yeah, one, great. Just will you do entropy one more time? Just tell me about that. Yeah, it's like chance. It's like, it's kind okay. of like, uh, the center cannot hold uh, chaos theory probabilities. So okay. um, at early levels, you can kind of nudge chance. So, um, well, at like first level, you can just kind of like sense weakness or um, seek out a coincidence and it'll happen for you because you can kind of like just search for that one moment when somebody comes out the back door of the kitchen okay. and the door's open. At, at, at later, you can start to kind of manipulate probability a little bit. So if there's a chance that you could throw a basketball and it'll just go right in the hoop, like without looking, you could nudge it so that that happens. I see. I see. So I, another question though, you keep saying at earlier levels and at later levels, where are we? You um, can't go higher. That's thank you perfect question. I should have mentioned this. You can't go higher than three dots in any of your uh, spheres right now, okay. which would mean you get to about intermediate. No one's going to be like a master of the mind yet where they can just totally erase someone's memory and okay. give them new memories or anything like that. Okay. Okay, cool. That, mm -hmm. That's great. Thanks. Okay. Um, uh, Sarah Rose, uh, let's talk about uh, Maria. Um, what, uh, how do you see her awakening? Uh, wh what, what was, uh, her life like, uh, and then what caused her to awaken and what kind of magic does she practice? Okay. So Maria, Maria grew up in, 
Uh, she's she is from a long line of Freemasons, and uh, specifically the Anglo-American branch of Freemasonry. And um, she herself would have gone through the lodge um, as well of her. Um, Freemasonry, though, at least the Anglo-American tradition only allows men. And I think like just before getting to the 33rd degree, she would have had this realization that she wanted to transition and been kicked out of the order. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. And I think her awakening came when she tried to complete the ritual to get to the 33rd degree on her own. Awesome. Uh, uh, I, I'm kind of taking it. The Freemasons are not a magical society. I think actually the rituals are supposed to inhibit kind of seeing the ineffable. And when she did it on her own, uh, she might have done it wrong and accidentally exposed herself to that sort of the truth or lack thereof. Yeah, um, that makes sense. And uh, I will say, um, just like I said for Amy and for, for Charlotte, you know, uh, Maria could be an orphan who is just kind of discovering all of this on her own. Uh, or it sounds like she practices a type of ritual magic that would belong to this like order of mages. And you've looked through the book a little bit. Did you happen to see the order of Hermes? I did. Yeah. And, uh, I actually, I had my own thought on where she might fit in. Oh, great. Okay, great. Let me hear it. Yeah. I, I think after leaving the Masons and kind of developing more of a radical anti-hierarchy queer political perspective, she would have found herself with the Queer Liberation Front. Right. And forgive me if this is too much, but in my mind, they would have started as an offshoot of the progenitors that oh, interesting. would have been sort of kicked out because of their, um, their sort of like experiments in gender variance and their acceptance of gender variance, and now probably find their place more comfortably with the hollow ones. Okay. Okay. I love that. Um, yes to all of that. So, uh, the progenitors, so that you've actually helped us get into another thing about the game. So there's a war on between all the magic people, uh, which is why you might be in danger if you're an orphan and you don't have a, a secret society backing you up. And some of the magic people aren't magic people. They're science people. And they're the people who have put all the rules of reality down for us in our current horrible technocratic <laughs> uh, you know, uh, dead in the mind deadening world of social media and pollution. And, uh, you know, they think that they've created the best possible world, the technocrats. Uh, but uh, many people disagree. Probably your characters disagree if you are part of a more magical, mystical tradition. Um, and you are saying that you were formerly, or your, your organization at least was formerly a part of the progenitors. And the progenitors are technocrats. They're part of the technocracy who deal with life. So uh, pharmaceutical companies are, are kind of puppets of the progenitors. Um, uh, biotech companies, um, genetic manipulation, and they can do things that are on the cutting edge of science in, in, in terms of medicine and in terms of genetics. Um, and uh, I love that. That uh, Do you think that she was actually indoctrinated into the progenitors before, uh, before, before leaving a hollow one? Or do you think that her organization just used to be part of it and broke off? I think her, the organization she's in would have broken off. Okay. It would have started back with you know, the Institute for Sexual Wissenkraft when people first started experimenting with sort of gender transition medicine, that's when they would have been kicked out, I think, from the broader body. So they would have split back in like the 1930s. Okay, great. And so they've become this kind of like uh, offshoot or affiliated group of the hollow ones. And the hollow ones are, uh, well, why don't you describe them since you, you've kind of chosen them? What do you like about them? My understanding of the Hollow Ones is they are a loosely affiliated collective of various smaller groups of um, of mages who don't ne aren't necessarily united by a certain magical tradition or or magical paradigm, but instead are united through their countercultural posture, their anti-establishment. They they reject the 
attempts to control them from the technocracy, but also don't fit comfortably into the hierarchy of the nine traditions. Right. So the nine traditions, uh, the hollow ones are actually this kind of 10th group that, uh, you know, the nine traditions uh, refuse to allow to join, but the hollow ones don't want to join anyway. They're like, we're our own thing. Um, and uh, they, uh, they're, they're almost like a group of orphans, a, a giant association of orphans who came together to kind of help protect each other. So um, I love it. Uh, I approve all of that. Where do you see uh, Maria's uh, spheres going? Definitely three in life. Mm -hmm. And then I'm thinking um, maybe more matter. I do think even though the Masons aren't themselves a magical organization, just having those sorts of mental structures in place when she does become exposed to her ability to do magic and all those metaphors surrounding actual stone masonry, I think matter would feel natural to her to manipulate. Yeah, interesting. So I'm thinking three in life, two in matter, and then maybe maybe one in in mind. One in mind. Okay, yeah, that'll allow her to kind of sense things, sense surface thoughts, sense emotions. Um, uh, I, I love it. And uh, I think uh, what an interesting kind of like, um, you know, uh, there's a couple different influences that go into her magic, which is why the nine traditions would kind of reject her. Maybe they'd be like, what masonry and, uh, you know, a sexual advising craft. What are you talking about? Like, you need to learn how to be a shaman. You know what I mean? You're like, uh, no, I do this kind of my own unique style. Um, what I will say to both Sarah, uh, well, all of our players is um, – Think about one tool, uh, just to kind of simplify things for yourself. One thing that you do for each of your spheres that is kind of your go-to. So, for example, if if Charlotte has mind, maybe her tool is alcohol. Like, that's how she usually works, works mind magic. She doesn't always have to use alcohol, but usually when she's working some kind of mind magic, she uses alcohol. Uh, like you're saying with matter, uh, Sarah Rose, like maybe, you know, you have a trowel or you have your Freemason accoutrement, like your, the, you know, the, the, the sash and stuff like that, you know, uh, Freemasonry tools you'd write. Uh, and then whenever you're matter magic, you, you, you break those out. If you want to do a more elaborate ritual or use something else when you're doing magic, you can, but that's just so you, you have one tool for each sphere that you have. So that when you're improvising on the fly, um, you're not at a loss having to come up with a whole elaborate ritual every time. You're like, oh, yeah, I'm using my Freemasonry tools again. Okay, got it. Um, so finally, we, we've talked a lot about uh, at the beginning about Avi here, uh, Aaron. And uh, I really like uh, – I think I kind of have an idea of his journey. But tell me about his awakening and then let's talk about his magic. Um, yeah, his – uh, his awakening, I think, happened when he was uh, forced to join the military. Um, I think he was he was born in like an ultra orthodox society, which he was removed from uh, by his mother, and they lived in Pittsburgh for a number of years before she died under mysterious circumstances, and he was sent back to New York to live with his father's ultra-Orthodox family, and there was a lot of trouble, and he was eventually forced to join the Israeli military, uh, which he did not want to be a part of. And after being sort of, uh, after his awakening during some kind of event while he was in the military, he was like interrogated by, what was the group that you told me about? Oh, the Lions of Zion. Yeah, I think he was interrogated by them some like Lions of Zion slash Mossad people, and he did not agree to join because he's not a Zionist and eventually made his way back to Pittsburgh to go to school. Great. And he maybe he's just been going to Pitt. I mean, it's a good school. Yeah. Yeah. I think he's a grad student at the University of Pittsburgh. And when did he have his sort of mental health uh, issues or early in his life or, or after the Mossad situation? or I think pretty much throughout his life he's had yeah. mental health issues. Um, 
I love this. I think that's probably why he was picked out by the Lions of Zion or, or whoever this like secret group was within the Israeli military. Uh, and um, it sounds like he has, he has, I mean, that's, a, that's kind of an interesting antagonist or someone who has been keeping tabs on him. Um, what kind of magic do you think uh, he has so what, I, in terms of your spears? I'm really not sure. I had started off thinking about mind because I'd been thinking of the character in terms of his mind. But the more I think about it, the less sure I am that that is what it is. Well, it's a good question. I mean, one thing I will say is he sounds like a perfect candidate to know how to use prime magic. That's and I know that that's a little bit... Um, a little bit scary because it's like what is that again but like if he's like doing all of these kind of like he really knows about magical systems and and you know right. the gematria and all that it kind of feels like he might be the kind of guy that does some meta magic you know um, totally. um and uh would know the most about i mean i know he already knows the most about the enigmas and the cosmology he's probably the one that's the most first in like magical theory and stuff like that um other than that i mean uh i love uh the idea of maybe even uh, entropy for him because i think that gematria yeah. and kabbalah are about that as well or maybe um, even time yep absolutely prime, prime, um prime time prime time oh my god Primetime Avi. <laughs> Primetime prime, Avi. Prime time Avi Dreyfus. Um, can, you, can you give me another example of what is like what the prime sphere can achieve? Yeah. So um, you could give paradox to other mages, meaning you give them like a paradox dice, which will yeah. mess with their magic. Just, yeah. You just fucking bamboozle them. I you, can find, you can find sacred sites that um, are called nodes, which are like sacred areas where magic is kind of like quintessence of magic is kind of prevalent. And that's where you can get your paradox down by like being near those places. But mages, well, that's what they wore over. They wore over these sacred sites because uh, those are the places that um, they need to, to build their magic schools around and things like that. Sure. Um, yeah, the more what, what other thing is you can't create something out of nothing unless you have prime too. So, okay. you know, he, uh, he looks like he's only taking really ephemeral spheres if he's taking like entropy and time and prime, but you might decide to give him, if you gave him matter or life, he could, with prime too, he could create those things out of nothing. He could create like a, a flower out of nowhere or a, you know, rock or whatever. Like uh, if he had, you know, prime two is necessary for that. Um, I can give you more examples if you'd like. Okay, but he couldn't do that without a mix of prime and matter or prime and life? That is correct here. Um, oh, he can do aggravated damage to other uh, characters because... Uh, mages can heal a lot of stuff very quickly, but if you add a little bit of extra prime, like you've shredded the like actual pattern of reality in them, you do this like very hard, uh, hard to heal damage. Um, you can channel power into your spells from magic sites and magical objects. You can sense magic. Uh, later with prime, you can turn items into magical items, uh, and uh, because you you know put magic into them using prime. Um, basically, uh, it's a tough one to, to play, but I would allow you a lot of a lot of it, leeway with how you're messing with like it. It sounds like the most applicable to sort of how I see his magic working. Yeah. I feel like with all the gematria and cryptography and stuff, he can just sort of like see the binary code of the universe exactly. a little bit. Yeah, yeah. totally. So you're like, you're speaking of Benedict Cumberbatch, you're the Doctor Strange. Then of is the that group. what Doctor Strange does? I don't. I don't know anything about Marvel. Oh, in or a another way. Benedict Cumberbatch, uh, Alan Turing, in uh, Ooh, yeah, uh, the Imitation yes. Game. That's a good movie. So you uh, you tell me where you're going to put those dots. Uh, a I feel of I feel like Prime and Time make the most sense to me, mm -hmm. but I mean I want to choose stuff that is useful it's all useful it's it's manipulating reality you know it's really just what what's going to make you smile when you when you right, get to do it in the game let's go for prime and time okay prime three time three is that what we're going for can i do that yeah absolutely prime three time three 
Yeah. Uh, and so um, uh, let's just talk a little bit about, is he a straight up orphan since he kind of uh, denied the lions of Zion are like, they're not a full tradition. They're not like this right. giant tidy. They're like a small craft of guys. Like they kind of only operate out of Israel. They have like a very pro uh, Israel stance uh, and they do, you know, um, Jewish uh, cultural magic, uh, sure. but you 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 didn't want to join them. You escaped them, and I kind of talked about like there's this group called the Celestial Chorus, who are all religious. Like they 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 combine into this giant meta religion of Christians and Muslims and Jewish people and every other religion under the sun. Uh, they think that all of all gods are like w different faces of one god, and we thought maybe they had tried to. Um, recruit you um but you had said no to them as well because in the pittsburgh area it's a lot of like protestant ministers and stuff that run the celestial chorus yeah that doesn't appeal okay great then i think that maybe you're an orphan but we can give you you know yeah, um, maybe the maybe the mossad guys are keeping tabs on me or something yeah i, lo I love that um so um on your sheets there is a um there is a space to write your and if uh, you don't have, it's at the very top. If you don't have Would one, just write. Um, possibly fit into the virtual adapts. Um, possibly the virtual adapts are sort of computer hacker mages who um, wants to uh, rewrite the code of reality using computers. Um, so uh, Avi would need to be very <laughs> tech savvy for that. Uh, nor they're another group that uh, broke off from the technocracy, uh, like back in like the fifties or something like that. What do you think of that? I think it would make sense that that's another group that's like interested in him. But again, I don't know if it like Avi's playing the field. Who uh, knows who Avi will join? But for now, yeah. his uh, for now his um, it's affiliation. His sect, uh, yeah, or his uh, yeah his affiliation. His affiliation is orphan. Uh, and then uh, under affiliation, you guys can um, can put uh, Verbena for uh, our friend Charlie Mazur. And for Maria Stone, you can put the hollow ones. Um, you'll see all this nature, demeanor, essence, all this stuff at the top. Oh, guys, we could do this all day. But for nature and demeanor, while we're just kind of talking about it, um, nature is who you really are inside. Demeanor is who you uh show to the world okay and uh there's a whole big list of them in the book i don't think you even need to mess with them you guys can just write something down that sort of describes how in you know, a nature who who is this person really deep down in their soul demeanor what kind of a person do they show to the world so for example demeanor party gal nature um detective right like so uh things like that like um and uh Put something like that down. It helps with the role play a little bit, and it helps you get willpower back when you spend it because you are going to be spending uh, willpower sometimes to do things. Um, so basically, like if uh, if you um, do something that really is very according to your nature, you're like, Jared, I did this thing according to my nature, even though it didn't really help me in the game uh, achieve any goal. It actually messed up my our plans, and it got my other cabal mates mad at me but I did do something according to my nature. Can I take willpower for that? And I'll give you some willpower back. Or you could be like, uh, Jared, you know, I, I feel like I really played my demeanor of the, uh, of the diplomat in that, in that scene. I really got those people to work together. Can I have some willpower back? And I'll say, absolutely. Generally, if you do something according to your nature, I give you more willpower back. If you do something according to your demeanor, I might give you a little less because it's a little more surfacey, right? Um, essence, and we're not going to deal with that right now. It basically has to do with your magical soul and what kind of a, <laughs> a magical uh, soul that you have. Um, <laughs> sect is whether you are part of the traditions or the technocracy. Um, only our friend uh, Charlotte, because she joined the Verbena, is uh, part of the traditions right now. You can write traditions for your sect, uh, Amy. Um, the, the, the other two, you're not, you're not, you haven't joined the traditions yet. The hollow ones are not in the traditions, So don't worry about that concept is just your character ideas. And that could be really simple. Amy, you could just write for Charlie. You could just write bartender, um, you know, um, whatever you think is a good, uh, you know, grad student for, uh, for Avi here. Um,
So um, I kind of want to. Um, I kind of want. We've been we've been creating characters for a while. So I kind of want to get us uh, to the end here. Um, and uh, I'll just explain a couple things. Your willpower is going to be equal. You see a willpower under advantages. That's going to be equal to your uh, resolve plus composure. We're going to use the uh, vampire V5 rule for how you determine willpower. Um, Wait, where? Sorry, is that towards the bottom of the... Oh, there it is. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And uh, willpower, you'll see that um, you can fill in dots, but you can see that there are also little boxes. So when you spend a willpower point to do something, you'll fill in a box under the dots that you have. Uh, so and of course, how you, do you never... fill in? How do you fill in the dots? So just uh, just click on the dots, and it's. Oh, uh... sorry. I mean, um, what are the number of dots that we get? Oh yeah, resolve plus composure. Got it. Thank you. Um, and uh, and then you um, when you spend them, you fill in those boxes when we're playing. Um, you're starting, uh, you're starting Paradox. Uh, I'm going to start you guys off uh, with a D3 each. I think that that's fair. That means wow. that you've just been accumulating some <laughs> Paradox, you know, with the, your, your early explorations into magic. And so first, let's do our, our friend uh, Avi Dreyfus. He starts with, oh, I'm sorry, three Paradox. Got it. Um, and our friend uh, Maria Stone, she starts with three as well. And uh, Charlie Mazur starts with, oh my God, you all, I rolled three, three times. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> wow, um, yeah. that feels fair. Um, <laughs> so now we do backgrounds. You can see the backgrounds there. Uh, and backgrounds are kind of like, uh, well, what are they? They're like social connections you have or like things that you have that aren't like innate, like uh, allies. Um, allies are friends who are gonna be with you through thick and thin and help you out. Um, contacts, contacts are like really useful people who owe you a favor, you know? Um, uh, then there's also um, uh, like the power of your soul, which is like your avatar. So there are more supernatural ones rather than get into every background that's available. I would just like to fill in five dots based on stuff that you guys tell me. So, for example, we know that a couple groups are trying to um, recruit our friend Avi. So, um, uh, I think that they're probably contacts for him. Like, he knows some other magical societies who really would like him to join. And so, in his backgrounds, he could write down contacts on the top line. And we know that he has maybe the virtual adepts want him to join, the celestial chorus... So he could put like two or three dots in there. And then anytime he wants to kind of like get in touch with uh, them, he might roll some dice and, and, and depending on how many dots he has in context is how big a favor that they will do him. And that, that could be anything from um, helping him with a ritual that he's trying to do or going into battle with him or something smaller, like giving him a name. Like he's like, I know that there's a wizard going around doing such and such a thing. Do you guys know who that is? So that's what his contacts would do. Does that work for you, Aaron? Does that make sense? Yeah. And then is there any other kind of thing? Like, do you think that he has, what does he have that is not innate to him? Like, it could be like a magical item he has. It could be like a, a, a really stalwart friend that he has. It could be that he has some fame from like a paper he published or or that he has some influence with a mortal group like grad like mathematics grad students listen to what he says and do what he says. He has influence with them. Like what do you think uh, what do you think he has? What 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 are your ideas? Hmm, I mean I was thinking about sort of, that's just more context though, but people sort of in the world of academia that he can draw upon. I love that. And so why don't we say uh, influence uh, and give him a couple dots in uh, uh, academia. Like he has some uh, he, he has flash in academia. Um, and so he can talk to professors, he can talk to other students and he can uh, he has pull over what they do and what they say. Um, and uh, so uh, with his contacts and his, uh, and his uh, influence, um, you get five dots in these backgrounds all together. Does he want anything else? Is there anything else you think that he has that we should, uh, we should put in there? I think he probably also has some influence with... Um... 
the world of ultra orthodox Jews. Oh, interesting. I really he, kind of love that. He so speaks, um, he speaks Yiddish fluently. He great. grew up for part of his life in that environment, even though he's not there anymore. So he could probably reach out to those people. Great. And I'm going to suggest one other thing for him. I think that he should take influence twice then. Um, okay. Maybe put a dot in each, put two dots in contacts, and then um, make sure you mark how the influences are different. So we remember it's like the Jewish community and the academic community. Mm -hmm. and then he should take a library, I think. Um, library is one of the backgrounds you can have where you, you know, I think that he's the one that keeps like kind of occult tomes and weird treatises on magic and things for everybody to use. Um, and, uh, maybe just one dot in that is good too. So is that all together? That would yeah. be, that, that would be good. five. So you've mm -hmm. done it. Um, and, uh, Sarah Rose and, uh, and Amy, you guys can kind of, you don't have to go with this like list. Just tell me what you think your character would have and we'll figure out how it translates. Uh, Amy, what do you think about Charlie? Like, what does she have in terms of um, backgrounds, uh, advantages? Um, and this doesn't have to be necessarily, I'm, I'm just going to keep saying verbena. Is that okay? We can just pronounce verbena it. Verbena is how we pronounce it. Um, okay. Let me try I, to get, let me get it. Verbena, verbena. Verbena. I, I think I think it's just a really funny word. It actually is a bit, it sounds real, it kind of sounds dumb, you know, because you just rub verbena on your skin. Yeah. Um, and it's verbena. And it's like real, nah, uh. anyway, I feel like a bit of a Karen saying it. So I how, love it. How I love it. How, how, how much have they hidden themselves in mysteries though? <laughs> that, that people think it's just this simple skin yes. cream. Yes. Um, so, but it doesn't have to, what I'm doing doesn't have to, have any ties to verbena as far as background? No, in fact, with, because you have the, the verbena, it doesn't have to. But okay. because you have them, like you could take things like uh, you have uh, like um, you know influence among the verbena. I don't know that your character would, but she could. Uh, yeah. uh, or you could kind of justify some things that a bartender wouldn't normally have. Um, and you could even right now like go to me like. Uh, uh, with like magical stuff, like, oh, you know, um, okay. Well, can I tell you, I, I come, I came up, maybe this will help. I came up with my tools. So for, for mind, I, I really do want to do alcohol and that's where I put my three dots and then yeah. spirit, I put two dots in spirit and, um, that'll be old, my old work schedules, which is like, I, I keep old work schedules in a binder and somehow that channels like other people, but also myself, but also time and calendars. Um, and yeah. then, and then life, which I only have one dot in, that's just uh, my cleaning rag. And that's like, if I need to know something or sense something, it's like, if I have my cleaning rag and I can clean it or touch it, um, if, if there's any version of cleaning it, then I can, um, achieve some magic there. Perfect. Um, so as far as backgrounds, maybe, maybe it is something around the calendar, like, uh, that I, I just understand calendar and time um, and weeks and, and just where things fit because I've probably made a bunch of schedules for people. Yeah. Why don't you take something called destiny? Uh, <laughs> okay. If, if I must. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of like um, you sort of have, uh, there's something prophetic about you, right? Okay. Um, something you're meant to do, there's a day coming that you know, or like certain days are obviously important to you. So <laughs> okay, you have five, cool. five dots here all together. The more dots you put in it, the more destiny you have. That means not only that you are destined for some great thing, but also that you have less free will, right? Like things, uh, uh, the prophecy keeps happening. It keeps uh, oh, hurtling cool. you towards something. So tell me how many dots you'd like in destiny. That's completely fine. Okay. Um, for now I'll put two, cause that sounds real cool. Yeah. Um, two in destiny. Uh, another one. I, I'm thinking just because, uh, like a party store, uh, where I can get all of my decorations. Um, and, but somehow that's a front for maybe another magical organization. Um, but yeah, I, I there's something I, I just really like the idea of her being really connected to decoration and physical, yeah. uh, manifestations of, of what these holidays are. Um, I have a thought. Okay. Um, I, I, I think that a, a sanctum where, 
her magic works a little better than <laughs> other places. And I think it maybe is Marty's and not a party store, but it could be both or it could be the okay. party store instead. But like when you are in, my, my thought is, my pitch, my pitch is that when you're in Marty's, your magic is a little easier. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Okay. I love that because, um, yeah, that'll, yeah, like a sanctum. So do I put Marty's sanctum? Yeah. Okay. Marty's sanctum. And, uh, for now, yeah, I don't want, I don't want to have too many backgrounds. I, I don't. Yeah. Why not two destiny three sanctum and you're good to go. Two destiny three sanctum. Okay, cool. Well, I mean, does that, does that railroad the story too much? Like, does that, I mean, cause I'm, I might be constantly going guys, let's just go to Marty's. It'll all be fine if we get to Marty's. Um, so for gameplay, <laughs> I, don't, I don't necessarily want to just be railroading. That doesn't know, railroad. That doesn't, doesn't. railroad. Okay. I mean, like the fact that you brought that up means you understand that sometimes she will okay. have to leave Marty's and sometimes she doesn't like that. She's like, we can just get <laughs> back there. I can do my stuff. Um, okay. Okay, cool. Uh, and it's also funny that she has this great destiny, but she kind of wants to hang out in this bar. You know? Like, <laughs> um, I think yeah. That, okay. Okay, great. Uh, I yeah, think that's then, really, really interesting. Okay. Um, and by the way, uh, I base the story on what you guys are giving me. I don't okay. have some elaborate plot ready. I'm gonna. I'm listening okay. to what's coming at me. Um, so when and, it's not like we're gonna just go to San Diego and then I'll be super far from Marty's. And <laughs> no, this is Magi of Pittsburgh. This we're staying Pittsburgh. in Pittsburgh. <laughs> uh, okay. We probably okay. will leave Marty's at some point, but uh, <laughs> but I'm not promising. Maybe it'll all no, happen maybe. in Marty's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one night in Marty's, a story for Magi of Pittsburgh. Um, okay, that's really great. And so okay. uh, your backgrounds are taken care of. And now yes. we will go to uh, Sarah Rose Kaplan, Maria Stone. What do you see her having What, it, what, what, what in terms of her advantages, her kind of connections? She definitely has allies, <laughs> allies which mm -hmm. is the Queer Liberation Front. Um, her Perfect. Street Medics. Uh, They've probably all dated each other at some point. Uh, <laughs> great. So, so they're loyal. Exactly. So there's a, there's an emotional connection there. So if you call them to help, they show up. They show up. They yeah. show up. They've been through shit together, uh, and they're committed. Then I think she has contacts. Uh, she has a few different contacts. She has like the broader anti-fascist street organizers of Pittsburgh. And also probably the broader queer underground. Um, Great. Um, and she might, I, and this might not be contacts. I, she does know all the Masonic secrets. So I'm guessing she can, uh, she has the Masons. Um, if they know she's been sort of excommunicated, then they're not super helpful. But uh, she does life magic. If she, you know, changes her form, she could probably get something out of a mason or two. Okay. Um, so it sounds like we definitely have the uh, the allies. That's great. Dots to spend right now. But um, how many dots do you think are going into allies? I think, well, one, I think she's just got that core crew that she works right. with. Yeah, so is that like one dot, two dots? So you'll oh. be rolling these as dice sometimes to see, you know, and then the more dots is the more they're likely to show up, the more talented okay. they are. I would say medics, who, as you say, are pretty loyal, that's at least a two in uh, in allies, okay. I'd say. Well, in that case, I will call the allies a three. Like, that is, they're her family, that the medics are her family. And then I'll ditch the Freemasonry, I'll, I'll put put it to contacts just as part of like the organizers of Pittsburgh and sort of the queer underground of Pittsburgh. Well, let's do this. I'm going to, I'm actually going to do one final thing because in, in, in this game, you're also supposed to spend all these freebie points once you've finished. And we've now finished. You guys have fantastic characters. I know their stories really well. They have great backgrounds. But you're out there. They also give you all these freebie points and you're supposed to spend all of those. And this is Creating characters in role-playing games always takes three hours. Instead of that, instead of spending all these freebie points, I'm going to say you guys have some extra stuff floating around out there. During the game, if you suddenly are like, wait, Jared, can I have this? I'll be like, yeah, you can have that. <laughs> You've already taken a lot of stuff. But right now, let's go ahead and pick one more thing we want. You were looking at your sheet, 
and you were like, ah, I really wanted more of this and I couldn't have it or, uh, <clears throat> man, I'd love to throw a little entropy magic on the pile there or uh, I think that uh, I, I want a magic item and I just didn't have the points for it or anything that you, you that what's the one last thing that you want? And I'm going to go ahead and start with Avi Dreyfus. What's the one last thing you'd like to give Avi and we'll give it to him? Oh, man. Oh, I one thing that's sort of important. Um, you'll see on your sheet there's a thing called Arete, R-A-R-E-T-E. And we are using that. It's going to work for our, for our viewers in the know. It's going to work a little bit now like Blood Potency works in Vampire 5th Edition. But basically, based on your Arete is how skilled you are as a wizard in general. Uh, and you can see it can go pretty high. But basically, you when you spend willpower to help your magic... Um, you'll get like a bunch of extra dice based on your Arete. So if anybody wanted to bring that up right now, now would be the time to do it. I think that like right now when you spend willpower on magic, let me look up my magic rolls here. You're going to get like some bonus dice if you spend one willpower on a magic roll. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, if you got a higher uh, level of Arete, which you could get right now, I'd let you go up to like two, you get more dice just by spending a, a single point of willpower. Um, so that's just one idea for the final extra thing that you could take. You do not have to take that. That's just one idea. I think that's exactly what I want to do. Oh, really? So, okay, yeah, excellent. I like the idea of having sort of a <clears throat> potent, magical wellspring. Well, it does explain why all these people want to recruit Avi. Like, he, he is sort of a uh, auspicious new... Uh, player in the game if he is like kind of like a novice but he ha already has two arete um he has a very intuitive grasp of the art of magic um and so uh that is the one last thing that avi will take amy vorpal what is the one last thing we're gonna give to uh we're gonna give to charlotte I the one thing I want her to be is a little dangerous because what we've done a lot is like she can calm people down and make people happy and, and fall in love and like maybe stuff like that. But but I also she's like, I think with spirit and also, you know, doing Halloween and also her background with her family, I just want to make her like noticeably dangerous, like maybe someone this uh, this feminine and, and maybe even small should not be able to bounce as well as she does. Um, and so so ideally that's that's something of like channeling her rage from her, you know, abuse uh, from her family and mm -hmm. and like channel, channeling that a little bit, a little bit more. So on the outside, like, I guess my nature, I just want to do my nature a little bit more. So my nature is survivor through rage and my demeanor is affable therapist bartender. So I just want to make sure that um, when when the nature comes out, she's she's pretty fucking vicious. Well, then I mean, th there's a couple ways we could do that. <clears throat> I love that, by the way. That all makes total sense to me. Um, why don't I mean she could take more brawl, or she could have skill in those ways. Intimidation. I'd let her have a couple dots right now as her one last thing. Or maybe you see her using her magic to kind of get an advantage, and you'd put like one more dot into. Um, life would maybe help her to like be stronger or break people's limbs or something like that or Ugh. survive things. Um, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I like the. I already have intimidation as a lot of my dots. I don't have any in brawl because I put it all in melee. But should I even that out? Is it will brawl and yeah. melee? They're pretty. Are they interchangeable, or are they, how are they? Doing? Yeah, melee is weapons. So whatever oh. Charlotte's doing, she's using like a baseball bat or something. If it's in melee, <laughs> okay, which I love. Okay, uh, uh, I have nothing in brawl though, but I guess that makes sense because she is. I don't know that she would just auto auto punch someone. She'd break off a, a leg of a chair first, I think. Um, or yeah, a and she can still roll to punch somebody. She would like just be rolling strength, for example. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's really up to you. I mean, you could make your last thing brawl and we could talk about how many dots it is. Or you could uh, grab that last life dot or you could uh, do another thing. I no, can I, Yeah, I want to do something. I want to do like maybe in the background or have a magic item that like um, changes that changes her face, like her form just a, a little bit when she's 
um, fighting so that like Ooh. it looks more it looks more it looks more like out of a horror film like you know when when the teddy bear is cute and then all of a sudden it like turns into a monster with a huge mouth a maw type thing i want her to be like that when she's fighting like whoa that it you know like she changes to the point where people are like that is not what i signed up for when i got in a fight with this i love it that's so fucking cool what yeah. is the uh what is the what do you think that item is what do you think it is um okay um, so uh, based on holidays and just like cool trinkets i want it to be like a childhood music box and she and maybe that was like it's it's it was ripped away from like all of at some point when she was three or four like her father that's when he turned and like alcoholism set in and um and but but she can remember like a good time with this music box and so it's yeah maybe it's it's like a really tiny little music box um very feminine and pink and uh and and it plays something really chill like mary had a little lamb or something uh and and it and it just it's like it's like it's one of those it's adorable until it's creepy and then she mm -hmm. just yeah gets this like kind of dead inside um, lifeless form for a little bit and uh, gets gr scrappier. <laughs> I love it. Um, I think that uh, there's a lot of ways you could achieve that effect. Like, so we're okay. kind of thinking out. So put put wonder in your backgrounds. Make it a wonder of two. I think if you're just kind of changing her lighting or like her appearance, like yeah. I think that I think this little music box does a forces to effect where it just kind of changes how people see her. Right? It like kind of creates an illusion. And I love this. Uh, what a what what a true weirdo! You bring out this little music box and you you know you turn it, and then when this like cute song starts to play, all of a sudden like and like all the low all the all the regulars are like she's getting the box out. Like that means she's about to like kick yeah. Some and she goes a little photo negative. Um, yeah. Not 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 to the point. Yeah, I don't want it to be too noticeable, but also yeah, it should freak out whoever she's targeting and yeah. it plays holiday themed songs of course yes you know, yes uh, yeah. for sure uh, <laughs> so uh and, and uh, on val uh, yeah actually <laughs> for valentine's day it can play like this kiss this kiss it's like <laughs> some stupid 90s no song. i love that it's like a toy from the 90s like yes yeah, um could you please clinton tricks add to just just our notes that has a forces to effect of kind of altering the lighting and uh, Charlotte's appearance. So that's great. That's the one last thing for our friend, uh, for our friend Charlotte. And then, Thank you. Uh, yes, of course. Um, and then what's our one last thing for, uh, for um, Maria? I'm considering a few options, mm -hmm. but I think, okay, I'm torn between, I, I want to lean into her black blackness. I mean, it's coming off of the last year of massive street protests. She either has just a sort of magical black bandana, which is an incredibly effective at hiding her identity, or some sort of magical gas mask, which is effective against not just tear gas, but maybe sort of any sort of any sort of environmental poison or magic, but I'm not sure. Well, I love the idea of a gas mask. And, you know, I love the idea that, like, these are kind of like modern wizards who, when they put their accoutrement on or whatever, like, they uh, they look, you know, like wizards in kind of this strange way. I also really love the blindfold that the Masons use. Uh, oh, yeah. And uh, um, I think that, oh, I thought that that's kind of what you were talking about at first. Um, but... It seems like you wanted to get that Mason influence in, and then we kind of said you run out of backgrounds, you know. So this might be a good way to get that in with your one last thing, and it can be it can be a magic item, or it could be, you know, you could take that background. There's a background actually called certification, which would mean that you know, as long as you uh, do a little a little bit of um, rolling to like, you know, change yourself or fit in with them, you are like, you know. A third level you are a third level mason who can kind of move among their circles if you want um it's up to you it can be any of those things what do you think feels fun to you uh you know i think it feels fun to have her be a, a badass in a gas mask i think i think it does too that's great um <laughs> the gas mask is gonna we should give it something really cool though so um, I gave, I, I, you know, we said that uh, our friend uh, Charlotte could have a, a level two effect with her uh, little music box. So uh, is there any sphere that you couldn't take that you think would be cool to have? Uh, 
uh, that the gas mask could do some kind of effect with. Um, yeah, so it, here's an idea. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if it could have an entropy too. And it, it's a gas mask. You know, it filters tear gas, obviously. Mm -hmm. I think also it may be rubber bullets, bean bags, any, any projectiles just tend to miss. Ah, yes, that's perfect. That's like a perfect entropy to effect. And it's like, uh, I, I know exactly where this character wants to be uh, and, uh, and, uh, and why they want to be there. So yes, uh, go ahead and take a wonder, uh, take two dots of it. And uh, we'll make a note that that is an entropy to effect uh, in our notes here. Um, uh, off camera, we have these notes, uh, and uh, it, it 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 only works against kind of bullets and projectiles and things that are being kind of fired at you. Just like, for example, Charlotte's uh, music box, it doesn't do anything with lights. It it specifically creates an illusion of an intimidating uh, figure, uh, changes the lighting and the and the forces in the area in that way. Um, so these wonders, they have a very specific effect they do, which is why they're cool, but they're not quite as good as you know just having your free a magical ability. Guys, we did it. We created three characters. <laughs> it only took us two, uh, an hour and 45 minutes. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> we are going to take a short break. When we come back, we are going to just kind of uh, uh, build the world of these characters just a little bit. And that will be today's session. So uh, I'm going to say goodbye for just a minute. And we will be back uh, uh, shortly uh, with uh, more Magi of Pittsburgh. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, and uh, head off and, and uh, pee and poop and uh, grab another cup of coffee uh, and uh, drain some Paradox, and we'll be right back. <laughs> Abracadabra, we're back. Hi, uh, we have finished our characters. Um, I, I'm so excited about these characters. Uh, these players have created characters with depth and all these cool ideas. Uh, and so now I'm gonna teach you guys how to do magic. So uh, now we're gonna kind of enter into the fictional world of our game. Yes, imagine if you can, the uh, magical land of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania <laughs> in, the, in the year 2021. Uh, 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 it used to be a place of steel mills. There, there's kind of a little bit of that left, but a lot of those have shut down. There are many kind of dive bars uh, on the South Slope like Marty's. Uh, uh, where where our friend Charlotte works. Um, there's a new tech sector over around Squirrel Hill. Um, it's kind of trying to, uh, the city's kind of trying to build itself as like a new place for young people to come. Portland's over. Now you got to come to Pittsburgh. Uh, Portland's too full. San Francisco's too full. Come see Pittsburgh. Um, it's a beautiful mid-sized city, you know, that has kind of some of the cultural stuff you want, but also sort of that old American culture that's still hanging on and it's deep in the rust belt. So there are plenty of abandoned buildings, uh, old factories that have been shut down, uh, crumbling edifices of a, of a industrial uh, tomorrow land that never really came to be the technocracy, you know, the, the villains of the mage game, uh, Pittsburgh was part of their plan probably for this bright, shiny, mechanical future where uh, the steel was the most important uh, resource that America has and it would be used to build skyscrapers and robots and flying cars. But it all went to rust out in the Pittsburgh snow and rain. And, and so that's the setting that we've built and now um, uh, I'm going to teach you magic by, by way of a little prelude before your characters meet on this particular night in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And you are all known to each other. I'll just mention again, you are part of a group, a cabal of friends. Um, we can figure out how you've become pals later. But uh, suffice to say, that's already happened. Um, right now, I'm going to just uh, have each of you practice magic T today before you came to meet undoubtedly at Marty's, Charlotte's Bar, uh, before you came uh, to a, a rendezvous uh, of your cabal at Marty's, you had, a, you had a chance, you had a reason to use magic sometime today or this evening. Uh, and let us start, actually, if you don't mind, with, uh, with our friend Avi Dreyfus. Avi, 
um, you had to use some your, your your power today. You had to access uh, your awakened soul and work magic today. Uh, why and for what reason? Um, earlier in the day, Avi was having a, he was having sort of a little bit of a rough mental health day, and um, found himself sort of out in the street uh, with a. Uh, uh, an SUV sort of bearing down on him, about to hit him, and he needed oh, wow. to stop the car with his time magic. And, oh, you know, amazing! <laughs> wow, that is a very rough mental health day. Yeah, uh, when you <laughs> almost got hit by a car. So uh, Avi, last last thing he remembers, he was kind of like working equations on his chalkboard or on his computer, and then uh, you know maybe he forgot to take his medication or. Uh, which often happens, you know, when people are, are are struggling and challenged by mental health, or maybe I don't know what happened, but at some point Avi found himself kind of sitting in the middle of an alleyway. Um, and uh, yeah, yes, he's he's like trying to explain. He finds he like comes to his senses trying to explain this theorem to just a group of guys on the street, and one of them just kind of is like. Get the fuck out of here and pushes him and he falls into the street and is about to get hit by a car. Okay, great. Um, so yes, in fact, uh, an SUV, uh, probably somebody who uh, works at one of these businesses that this alley uh, joins onto, uh, they're just barreling down the alley, not looking, not looking for these people experiencing homeless and homelessness and not looking for Avi, who has just kind of fallen out into the middle of the street. And so uh, Avi must quickly use his power to prevent uh, taking an enormous amount of uh, crippling damage. Yeah, uh, I didn't from... really think about that before. Wow, I... but okay, here we go. Here it's we all real now. You created this situation, and now you must survive <laughs> it. So um, let us look uh, at how you would put together a bell. So what is uh, Avi's focus for his time magic? His What is his tool that he uses? So I think, that, does it have to be a physical tool? It does not. It could be like a, something that he does. Okay. Here's what I was thinking of. Um, so Gematria has to do with these sort of numerological assignments to which then sort of give words um, like spiritual resonance. So yeah. I think he has like words of power. I love that. He doesn't necessarily even have to say them. He can just think them. Ooh. Oh, um, I'm going to actually, this is where the storyteller is going to go. No, he needs to say them or he needs to like write them down. Otherwise okay. it's just like, you know, uh, we don't want Samantha and Bewitched going mm, 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 and stuff happening. Sure, like sure, sure, you got to okay. just do a little more if you want the bonus uh, that you'll get from using your tool. If you don't yeah. need the bonus, then don't worry about it. But I think in this case, um, he's going to slow down time or stop time so that he has time to get out of the way of this SUV before its tires crush him. So um, here's what we ask. Um what are we going to roll? You're going to roll an attribute plus your sphere rating. So you have a time. What? How many time dots do you have? Three. Okay, great. And then what attribute do you think Avi uses when he is kind of calculating his um, his gematria and like picking the right uh, word that will like kind of affect time around him? Intelligence. Intelligence. I agree. Um, so he's going to roll intelligence plus time. Um, okay. By the way, viewers, if you are familiar with Old Mage, I'm doing this differently. I'm, I'm kind of applying a new uh, system based on Vampire the Masquerade 5th Edition, where uh, the spheres work a little bit more like disciplines do in Vampire. You add an attribute to a, uh, a rating, and he has a three in time, so that's what he'll use. Um, and uh, now we're going to figure out the difficulty. The difficult so, so I'm sorry. So if you're rolling your attribute, your intelligence plus time, you're going to take as many dots as you have, and you're going to pick up that many ten-sided dice. Oh, so God, how many? How many is that. that? I don't even have that many ten-sided dice. It's oh, eight. that's okay. Maybe you would use a um, you would use a, a dice roller online. That's completely fine. Uh, uh, um, I, I have more. I just don't have them in front of me. So for right now, I'm just going to use a dice roller. Okay, great. So that's eight d10s because you only roll d10s in the White Wolf games, um, and now. Um, 
we are going to, so you're rolling eight dice. That's really good. Um, but I'm going to say the difficulty, um, the difficulty is this. The difficulty equals the highest sphere you used. So the difficulty is at least three. That's how many successes you need to get. Um, and uh, successes are any of the D10s that come up six or above. Okay. So you're rolling eight dice and you want three of them to come up at six or above. Okay. All right. Um, but we're not done yet. Okay. Because this is where mage gets really interesting. Um, when you cast magic, if normal people could look at it and not know that you cast magic, it's a little easier. If normal people could look at it and it seems obviously magical or impossible, it's a little harder. Um, and if there are actually normal humans who don't do magic, like watching you, it gets even harder. Sure. So, so if you, and you're slowing down time right. in front of a group of uh, men on the street who you were explaining your theories to. Yep. Um, and I think slowing down time looks obviously magical, right? Um, so uh, I think that that's going to be, uh, we call that, we call it coincidental magic if it looks like a coincidence or it looks like it could be explained away some other way. But this is what's called vulgar magic. Um, so your difficulty goes up by one for vulgar magic uh, because... Uh, slowing down time uh, is obviously uh, magical, but you have what are called sleeper witnesses. You guys are awakened, uh, but these homeless uh, men who are watching you, they are sleepers. They're not mages. So uh, you, actually your difficulty is the highest sphere you use plus two. So a spell using time three is going to have a difficulty of five. That's how many of your eight dice must come up at, uh, at a six or above. It gets worse, everybody. Um, what? Uh, this, no. well, Just let him slow down the car. No, no, no. <laughs> because you're going to see the advantages that you can bring to bear to, to make it a little bit easier. But the only, the, the final thing that I'm going to say is, and, and, and by the way, uh, our friend uh, Aaron just picked a really interesting but very difficult situation to cast magic in. Fast casting. <laughs> Casting something in one combat round increases the difficulty again by one. Um, so right now you need six uh, of the dice to come up six or above in order to uh, in order to do this. That seems really hard and maybe impossible, but I think the SUV is going to hit you in one combat round. So your difficulty is currently six. Uh, then the next part of my note says, how do I get the difficulty down? Foci, tools that help with your magic. You may use a single dedicated tool in each casting. This tool uh, is a, a, your unique thing that uh, helps you get the difficulty down. Uh, and uh, your, your okay, you know what? I actually wrote that the foci are physical objects. So he, he at least needs to have something that helps him do the gematria, the gematria, pardon me. So does he have like a little book about it or, or maybe? Um, so... Um, there are, in Gematria, there's this, like, how do I explain this? There's a diagram which is expressed on the hands of the different mm -hmm. numerical values of different letters. I think he has those tattooed on his hands. Great. Uh, done. Um, so he's awesome. looking at, He's got to be able to look at his hands, uh, to be able to kind of do this stuff. And so, uh, the, the SUV is bearing down on him and, uh, he puts his hands up. Uh, and uh, that um, that does some things for him. It takes the difficulty down by one. You're using your your dedicated tool. Um, uh, are yeah. you casting near uh, uh, a node? No. Are you casting in a in a sanctum? No, you are not. Are you casting on uh, mage uh, helpers who are called sleepwalkers? They're not technically mages, but they believe in your gematria. No, you're not. Are you spending extra time? No, you're not and you're not using a sympathetic token connected to the target, all of those things can take the difficulty down. Uh, okay. But unfortunately, you've only managed to take it down by one. So you're you're having to spend your eight days right now, but get five successes, because you did take it down by using your dedicated okay. tool. Um, there's um, one more thing that happens every time we cast magic. One more thing. And it, it sounds, it'll become second nature soon, guys, but right now it sounds so complex. And I'm gonna help you through it every time. But right, there's one more thing you need to do, and that is 
you need to uh, roll a single six, uh, single ten-sided die, uh, and tell me if it comes up six or above. And if uh, because you're casting vulgar with witnesses, you're going to get two paradox. And then if this one comes up five or lower, you're going to get one more paradox. So you're going to earn three more paradox. And what happens if Avi okay. dies right here? I know, right? That would be so well, the, I mean, our story is already forming just with like a quick kind of uh, magic roll, right? Um, how'd you do, Avi? I got a seven. A seven. So you didn't get more paradox. You took two paradox from this, okay? Because okay. you're casting in front of sleeper witnesses and you're doing something obviously magical. Um, so uh, your paradox, which started at three, is now at five. And got so it. of your eight dice... I want you to designate designate five of them as paradoxes, okay? Oh, and okay. if you critically hit on this by getting two tens and one of the tens is a paradox die, or if you fail, if you don't get the five successes you need and some of your paradox die are ones, the paradox is going to go off and something magical is going to go haywire here. Like, it, it simulates when mages, like, they mess up their spells and something strange happens, okay? okay. So uh, let's see so how we do. So I need five successes and I need to not roll tens on my paradox dice? Or ones on your paradox or dice one. if you okay, fail. Well, so for example, if you got uh, only four successes altogether and then one of your paradox dies had a, had a one on it, that would mean that you've done what's like called like a, uh, a, 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 a failure. A, uh, a magical failure, and that will earn you a paradox backlash. Uh, when, okay. when you when you critically hit, but you you know some of your paradox dies come up at ten, you create a paradox phenomenon, which sometimes can be good for you, but it can be like too good for you. Like you were trying to create a cupcake and you created a feast, you know. And then um, sometimes people will notice that you're a mage, and things can get complicated for you. Um, okay, here we go. I really Ooh. can't wait to see what happens here. God, all right. Well, we might be starting off with me in the hospital. Let's see how it goes. Okay. There's only 20 boxes for paradox paradoxes. That's right. Um, uh, so it can fill your entire dice pool when you do magic could be paradox dice. Uh, and the only way to get paradox to go down is by either having it go off, then it all goes away, uh, or by spending time at a node, one of those sacred places I talked about where like kind of meditating near it or kind of absorbing its mystical power makes your paradox go away. Okay, Avi. Okay. So it's, it's time to work four, your magic, buddy. Four paradox dice, right? Um, I think you have five, right? Because you started five, with three. Five paradox dice, okay. Yeah, because you started with three, but when you do- oh, yeah, um, yes. You... yes, I do, I do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, I got five successes, but I did get a 10 on one of my paradox dice. Ah, okay. So um, you are burning five uh, paradox, right? Okay. So do, do those uh, go away? Uh, they all go away. You've lost your paradox, but something strange happens. I'm going to make okay. it be a, a paradox flaw occurs. Strange changes and transformations occur in the world. Milk curdles, dogs bark, watches stop. On the high end of this spectrum, the changes will be noticeable and uncanny. Floating dishes that fall to the floor and shatter. Everyone talking backwards for 60 seconds. The rooms in a house rearranging themselves. These are the kinds of things that happen when you get a messy uh, critical with your magic roll like you just did, where your paradox dice came up as tens, right? Wow. Um, what, did you just have one 10 in your Paradox Dice? Yes. Did you have a 10 anywhere else? No. Ah, then you just succeeded. You have to get two 10s to get a critical. I'm sorry. Oh, I should have been okay. clear about that. So you just did a good job. You just succeeded. Oh, all right. And you I did don't it. create a Paradox flaw. So as these guys are watching and they're like, hey, watch out. Holy shit. Like, uh, Avi, like, <laughs> just describe what you do as this SUV hurdles down on you. Uh, Avi puts his hands out and he has the same tattoos on the front and back of his hands and he um, sort of shouts a strange word in another language and the car slows down just enough for him to roll out of the way. Right. Um, and uh, the car just sort of like, it's like very clearly like moving more slowly through space in a way that it couldn't. But Avi is moving at regular speed and he just kind of, 
I think uh, if I may narrate a little bit, he just kind of crawls slowly out of yes. the way. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then suddenly time goes back to its normal speed and the SUV clatters down the alleyway and Avi's okay. Now, I'm just going to show you a couple other ways this could have gone because we're kind of learning to play the game. <laughs> Avi could have argued, or the player Aaron could have argued, Jared, a car cars slow down sometimes. Maybe my spell looks coincidental because it just looks like a car is slowing down. I didn't think of that until we'd rolled all of this, but maybe Aaron would have argued that, and it's completely okay for you guys to you know say, "Hey, okay. wait a second, That's I wanted to, to go this way." I did um, think I did think of that, but I didn't say anything. Um, make sure your five paradox stayed, though, my friend, because we decided that you, yeah, they stayed didn't burn it off uh, you you didn't get so a critical is getting two tens and a critical that creates paradox is one of the tens is on is okay. on the and you have to succeed as well you get two tens and you succeed okay. um okay um sarah yeah. rose kaplan talk to me about uh maria stone uh, <gasps> when did she when did maria use magic today i think in contrast to the drama of avi's near miss there uh we see Maria in a sort of just a lovely little domestic scene, uh, an increasingly rare moment of peace for Maria and her fellow medics. I think it's probably around 1 p.m., which for them is time to make breakfast. And they live in a cooperative way, and it's Maria's turn to make breakfast, so maybe Maybe Annie is up and sprawled into an armchair reading some book. The other three are just starting to stir. And Maria is is making a lovely little bit of avocado toast. And her <laughs> magic is... Um, this is a group of, of life-focused mages. I think they would have a lovely indoor garden. And she walks over to pick some cherry tomatoes, which at first glance aren't quite ripe. But... Her magic is, well, you just have to look under the right leaf, and there they are. They're the perfectly ripe tomatoes. Um, that's beautiful. Um, how much? How many life dots uh, does our friend uh, Maria have? Three. Three. Okay. Um, that is enough, I think, to kind of uh, accelerate or augment maybe tomatoes that are already budding there and kind of get them to kind of plump up. And if you say that she's literally like pulling leaves back, we can call it coincidental. Um, what is her tool uh, for life magic? So her the tool I had listed for her life magic, because I was mostly focused on her as a medic, would be her first aid kit. Um, so in this case, but you could use something different here or forego the tool. This might be an easier role than our friend Avi was making. So maybe she doesn't need her tool in this particular case. Okay, no problem. So the, the difficulty won't go down. Um, I think that uh, – let me just look at uh, life magic and see if, if, if you're using life three to do this or if you're maybe using a little less. Maybe you're using life two to do this. Let me just – look at the rules here for a second because if you're using life two that that will affect the difficulty a little bit um oh wow oh thank you clinton trucks although i choose to ignore all of this anytime i want um uh, <laughs> at, at sphere rank two the mage begins to make small alterations uh yes uh although not yet able to perform dramatic effects gains a small degree of control over the sphere's principles oh well that's as vague as i need it to be uh, i am going to say that <laughs> <laughs> I am going to say that this is uh, this is going to be. I actually I like the wikis more because I think the nerds that put together wikis have thought this through way more than the people that wrote the book. I mean, come on. Uh, let's see what I can get uh, when I look at Mage the Ascension and I look at the Life Two level here. Um, alter simple patterns and heal yourself. Uh, you can influence simple life forms. I would say a, a tomato is definitely a simple life form. So I'm going to call it a, a difficulty of, uh, let's see, it's gonna, you're only using life two. You don't have to bump it up to life three to make this work. Um, so, and it's coincidental. So your difficulty right now is two. Uh, it's, uh, but you're, and you're not using your um, tool. So, you're not taking anything off the difficulty, but in order to find a nice plump tomato under one of these leaves, you just need to give me two successes on your life magic roll. What attribute do you think you'll use? 
I think she uses composure when she's doing life magic, or at least when I she's love doing that medicine. She does, but mm -hmm. I think it would be the well, same here. Well, yeah, no so, uh, principle applies uh, because Maria, you know, um, that's how she's learned to kind of channel her life magic. And so, uh, without even a tool, you just need to roll your composure plus life and give me two successes. You need two that come up six or above. Oh, but wait, I forgot. You have three paradox. Make sure there are three paradox dice used in that pool. And you are going to roll one die and see if your paradox goes up before you cast. Can we see a tomato paradox? Uh, that would be awesome. So my one die was an eight. You do not. So if it had come five or lower, you would have gotten a new point of paradox and gone up to four. And but it didn't. So... So you just need three paradox dice in your dice pool of composure plus um, life. Okay. Oh, I can't. I want this to go wrong so badly. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Well, I had uh, seven successes. That's a lot. Okay. Um, so Dang. seven dice came up uh, uh, six or above in your dice pool. And um, are two of them tens? One of them is a ten. Okay, so you need two tens to critically hit. So there's no way that this could have gone uh, awry. And I'm just going to say with that many successes. Um, and by the way, when you get a lot more successes than I told you you needed, you can then say, Jared, I'm adding this and this and this to that tomato. These are extra things that happen with the tomato. <laughs> <laughs> so for example, you could go, hey, I got like five more successes than I needed. So Jared, this is the best tasting tomato anybody's ever <laughs> tasted. This tomato is so large that it gives like it's enough food for everybody in the house. You know, you could, and I'm going to let you in the future come up with these things. Sarah, do you have any thoughts now on this tomato? Yeah, I think when she pulls back the leaf, it's not just a little cherry tomato she finds. It's a whole stock that, you know, you might not have noticed at first glance. And so there are enough tomatoes to make everyone in the house a lovely bit of avocado toast beautiful um and that is uh the opposite of avi's magical role for sure um and uh, i'll say uh you have you have taken care of your allies so well because that's your allies group or your fellow uh queer medics uh and annie who i've i've made a note of that they will be extra responsive if you need to use them later in the adventure because you've cared for them so well so they know that they've got to take care of you um, and now, finally, uh, we're getting closer to the meeting at Marty's uh, that all these ma magi are going to attend. But right now, I want to know, how did Charlie uh, Mazur, uh, Amy's character, how did you use magic on this day? Um, well, it's a combo. I got, I needed, I guess, okay, can this, can this um, meeting, I want the meeting to happen a li even later than, than what I, what it's about to happen. Because Charlie is bartending and she's met a guy at the bar who's been like putting on the moves and it's actually going really well. And he, he, he's, he's not a townie. He maybe just two hours outside. So she's never met him before. And that's good to not be from Pittsburgh, just based on the, the trash that she knows. And she wants to go out with him and he he said, what time are you off? And so she wants to clear the bar and empty it earlier than usual. Um, it would also help for the meeting later, but she she wants like a couple of hours where she can go to a different bar and maybe get a drink. Uh, so she wants to clear out the bar and she wants to do it using um, her holiday magic, Labor Day. And I'm gonna say that <laughs> holiday magic is two-sided. You can use the joy of the holiday that it's normally separated for, but it has a shadow side. So Labor Day is normally about rest um, and feeling really good, like you've worked really hard and you're celebrating that. But the other shadow side is feeling exhausted. And so she needs to clear out, she's going to channel Labor Day and try to get everyone in the bar feeling just like they can't tonight. They just can't. Like, no, no more, no more drinks. No more conversations. If if they could just go home and sleep, they everyone feels like it's just not. It's just not the vibe. So she's um, gonna try to vibe out the place. I love it. Uh, the exhaustion of the working man. 
that's perfect. So um, what attribute uh, and sphere do you think she is using for this? So this is definitely going to be um, mind for sphere and she's mm -hmm. gonna use her tool, which is alcohol. And um, then she's going to use, I think manipulation. That's it. That sounds right. That sounds good. Um, so you're going to add manipulation plus uh, your mind sphere. How many dots do you have in those things? Manipulation is three and mind is also three. Okay, great. So you're rolling with six dice uh, to begin with, and you are clearly have access to your tool that you use for your mind magic. So that'll take the difficulty down in a minute. Also, this is coincidental. I think that uh, all of these people, I mean, I've lost. Oh, I want to make it of... harder. I want to say it's Friday night. So this this probably <laughs> this probably should be a party night. So I don't want it wow. to be coincidental. I was already going to make it harder for you. I think oh. that no matter, uh, but I'll make it harder in that way and this way. Um, okay. So these people are really kind of raging when you start this. <laughs> uh, yeah. okay. And I will also say that the fact that you want to affect a bunch of people at once makes it quite difficult as well. Um, so, um, the sphere that you're using though, is just mind too. You're just kind of trying to create an emotion, kind of sway the emotions of these people. Um, uh, so the difficulty starts at two. Um, I am going to think, I think it's coincidental whether you want it to be or not, because you're not like suddenly making everybody go like, Oh, fall to the ground. Like I can't move. You're like uh, making them yeah. go, I think I'm kind of tired of being here, uh, and slowly kind of uh, shuffle out. So That's it is true. coincidental, which is good. Um, but I'm going to add difficulty. I'm going to add difficulty for the fact that they're raging. They are nowhere near the mood that you want them to be in. And then I'm going to add two difficulty because of how many people there are. Oh yeah. Uh, you're kind of trying to do a wave, but you are giving, you are serving all of the drinks, right? So you I do are have able control. to, yeah. yeah, you are touching each of them in kind of a significant way by preparing their food. So I think that our difficulty is two. Uh, plus the one difficulty for uh, how how hyped up they are, plus the two difficulty for the number of people. So you need five successes here, uh, but we're going to take down one difficulty because you, um, you, you've you got your tool with you. So you are at a four difficulty. So you need to roll your six dice and get four successes. But before you do that, remember that out of your six dice, three of those dice should be paradox dice uh, because your character already has three paradox um, and um, you need to roll one die and see if you gain more paradox. Because even when you do a coincidental magic, magic always has risk. So if that die comes up five or lower, you're going to be at four paradox. Okay. I got an eight. Okay, so you don't get more. You don't earn more, more paradox for this for this spell. Um, you have um, you have uh, just three uh, paradox dice, three regular dice, and you're rolling your entire dice pool of six, and you need four successes. Okay, and when just for some flavor, when I when I use my tool, um, it's it's uh, swiping up in one line the condensation on the glass. So some people have noticed at the bar who are regulars that every once in a while they'll get a Charlie a Charlie finger, you know, just swiping up the condensation. Um, I've tr I've tried to explain it away, but it's happened too many times where it hasn't happened. It has happened. Like maybe some of the regulars are like, something's going on when I get this like finger finger swipe on my glass. Okay, yeah, um, I like it. Um, I'm gonna make a note of it. Okay, okay. So I have three paradox dice, three normal dice, and I need four successes. Oh, I hope it fails. Here we go. This will be. I just. I don't. I don't hope it fails, but part of me is interested um, in seeing something <laughs> fail. I. I don't think it would go too bad, but it's also. Oh wait, it's also Marty's. This is sanctum situation. Oh yes, the Marty. So if you're in a sanctum, oh, that man. makes that makes something good happen for you. Thank you so much for reminding me of that. Um, so that is a way to get the difficulty down. Um, negative one difficulty. You only need three successes in Marty's. Okay. Nice. Cool. <laughs> All right. So same dice pool, and and then we pull from there. That's right. Okay. The red ones are paradox dice. Okay, so I have, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Okay, I have in the blues, in my blue dice, I have a 10, an 8, and a 9. Okay. Pretty good. And then in the reds, I have a 6, a 4, and a 6. So I have five successes. Yeah. Man, I really wanted it to fail, but also this is <laughs> going to be great. 
Yes. So, I mean, it will happen. Don't worry. I mean, I've played the the vampire mechanic long enough to know that eventually something goes haywire okay. and the paradox is always going to be going up, but you don't want it to happen every time or you you never achieve anything as a character. Okay. Uh, but tonight you got two more successes than you needed. Uh, and that means that you can tell me uh, give me, get, add two details, but they are all, you know, you see people kind of like first, everybody gets a little quieter. Like it's less of like a dancing and shouting situation. Soon they're all just kind of watching sports on the TV and one by one people start heading out the door. Um, I don't think it is Labor Day, right? I think that like you, uh, so you channeled Labor Day. Maybe you moved the calendar or you looked at the old work schedule and then you started serving the beers, right? Something like yeah, that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay, no problem. Um, I understand it. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's only a few people left. They're all shuffling out. And the guy is like, uh, so can we get out of here? Yeah, and so the the bonus fun part is not only have people like are are they trickling out? Um, Marty has seen this interaction. And he's known that like I've had some trouble with men in relationships, and he's on my side. And and simultaneously, the like the two maybe there are two other dudes there who are um, like one of them at one of them is kind of hanging on to leave because he's also interested in me, which gives this like other guy a little bit of competition, which is A plus um, for the situation because I, I'm able to turn down the other guy and, and talk to this guy, which makes him feel really good. Um, and then and then also the, the other guy uh, is, he just knows me and is, is like he and Marty are kind of talking me up. Like they're they're like, oh, that's a, you know, just kind of words like, oh, good, she's a good catch. And like, you take care of her, you know, just like being, uh, just generally like just pro me, I guess. And it's, it's helping. That happens. And not only that, but I told you we would throw in some other dots here and there to represent those freebie points. We kind of skipped over a little bit. Yeah. I didn't know Marty was still in your life. Uh, actually oh, yeah. take, write down allies in your backgrounds and one dot cause Marty's very old. Uh, but he can, he's so useful. He can, um, wait bar, not quite as good as he used to. And he can talk you up. And also he can kind of, he has some pull with the regulars. Um, yeah. So. Okay. So, so your name, your name is um, like uh, Jerry. And, and so, uh, yeah, I'm like, yeah, Jerry, I, I, you know, I don't really, I don't really date patrons. Uh, this would be a date, right? Uh, I mean, I thought, well, let's see if Jerry needs to roll his insight to see. Uh, to, he needs to roll his like ability to understand people. Um, is he clueless? You said he's. You said he seems pretty smart, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Then I'm going to give him a decent dice pull for this. Oh. Uh, and let's see if he can get enough successes to know that y you know that you want it to be a date. Okay. Um, and he rolled. One, two successes. I think that's enough. And he goes, yeah, uh, yeah, it would be. All right. Well, I guess uh, maybe, yeah, maybe uh, I'd have to, I'd have to see what the boss says, you know, Marty. Go. What are you kidding? Get out of here. You, you think you can handle this Friday night crowd by yourself? Uh, shit. Uh, uh, yeah, I think I, I think I got it, sweetheart. Don't worry about it. All right, Jerry. Well, I don't just leave this place to go nowhere. Where are we going? Um, and he suggests like a wine bar that's like kind of over in the hipster section of town, like Squirrel Hill. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Am I going to have to get a new shirt or something? We're crossing the river. I think you need a new shirt. Well, then that's going to be another, another, another stop because this is the nicest shirt I own. You think I go, you think I go to work at Marty's and don't dress up? Uh, we, I mean, we could stop at your apartment. I'm, I'm fine with that. All right. Oh, he's getting, he's getting really bold now. Unfortunately, I have to end your romantic encounter because <laughs> that's when your two cabal mates come walking into the bar. Okay. I thought that the meeting was planned, but apparently it wasn't. They need to talk to you. Oh, um, shoot. And when you see them walking in, you're like, oh, fuck, I had plans, you know? Um, yeah. Oh, what gives, guys? So Jared, is do you have in mind what gives? 
Um, yeah, I think I have in mind what gives, but I'm really enjoying how these players kind of uh, create their own problems. Um, <laughs> so um, I think since you uh, piped up first, Sarah Rose Kaplan, you need to tell me uh, a, a very big problem, and it has to do with magic. It doesn't have to do with regular people stuff that you are coming to talk to your cabal mates about. You've already you've already grabbed Avi, and now you have to talk to Charlotte. And I can give that problem to you, or this opportunity to you, or you can come up with it on your own. I'm fine either way. Uh, I mean, I'll make one up. I'm happy to do that. Go for it. Remember, it's gotta be a magical problem, and I'm so happy I'm giving this responsibility to the player who read some of the book. <laughs> okay, um, Sarah Rose Kaplan, you're you're, you're setting up our, our cliffhanger here. Uh, have have our friend uh, Maria tell uh, Charlie why she's not going on her date. Okay. Listen, Maria, I don't want to like freak you out or anything. We got a big problem here. Oh so, wow! Way to be dramatic, Maria. I'm I'm just on my well, way out with uh, this guy Jerry. See Jerry, my friend. Hi, Jerry. Hi. Yeah, yeah. No, no, thank you. Uh, listen, and I'm just gonna pull 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 Charlie over to the side. One 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 second. He's hot, right? I honestly I couldn't tell you. Okay. Listen, th this is serious, Charlie. Last night, we were bashing the fash, doing what we do. This proud boy rolls up, right? And he gets hit in the head. I go to check on him. No blood. I think we're get I think we're dealing with robots. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Wait. What was wait, did was he okay? Is he okay? I mean, I know I don't I don't really I, I'm way more Is he okay? He's not real, he's not alive. He's not alive. He's some progenitor automaton. I think they might have found us. I think they're coming after the institute. I think they're coming after the medics. Well, what'd you do with them? Where is where's the body or the? I, I, what did I do with? It? I threw him in the river. Oh my gosh. The Monagahela. I chucked him in. Oh my gosh. I, I freaked out. I'm sorry. Listen, no, no, I no. It's fine. Freak out. I normally don't freak out. Let's see this. Uh, let, no, I, 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 I couldn't be happier than uh, Android Proud Boys. And uh, now I will uh, finish uh, today's mini session by uh, uh, cutting to the Monongahela. And we just see like out of the water, like hours later, almost 24 hours later, like <laughs> this guy get up out of the water. Uh, and now you see that he uh, like searches in the water a little bit till he finds his red cap and puts it on. Oh uh, and he gosh. just starts to like wade out of the Monongahela and one of his eyes blinks red, blinks red, blinks red. The technocracy has infiltrated the Proud Boys. Oh my God, what an adventure <laughs> this will be. <laughs> uh, so that was good. a Great hook. Um, so, so that is good. our cliffhanger, and that is our session. Uh, we have created characters, we've set up the stakes, and we've learned how to do magic. Next time, this cabal of mages will have to defeat robot proud boys in Pittsburgh. <laughs> yes! <laughs> I love it. Oh my yeah, gosh. Yeah. Sarah, brilliant. That was really brilliant, Sarah. Oh, uh, thank you to Sarah Rose Kaplan, to Aaron Urist, and Amy Vorpal for being here, for bringing their creativity. Find them on their socials. Tell them how much you uh, loved uh, their their performance in this game, and find the other stuff they do, and, and patronize that. Um, I will say goodbye for now, but thank you guys. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank that you. was awesome. Uh, yeah, you guys were great. Okay, um, that's it. That's it for our little mini session of uh, Magi of Pittsburgh. When we come back, we'll play. Uh, be sure to uh, you know uh, get on the Discord. Let us know what you think. Uh, and uh, watch all of our shows. Vampires of Pittsburgh will be back soon. Uh, we have um, uh, some new Blades games coming up in the nearish future. Uh, and we just really appreciate you viewers. Uh, so thank you to viewers. Thank you to Clinton Trucks and Brian Baldinger, my producers and partners. Thank you to Megan Arch, our social media manager, Matt Moynihan, our YouTube content producer, and Jill Petrachek, who does our art direction. Um, you guys are all great. Thank you. And... Uh, uh,
that's it. I need a, I need a catchphrase for the Magi. I, I need some kind of mage catchphrase. Uh, reality is a lie. Reality is a lie. Okay, shut off the feed. <laughs>